Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then... You ain't black. Welcome back to A Quarter to Wikipedia with Bang and Dang. And right off of a special Hamas-Israeli conflict war, whatever you want to call it. October 16th is the 61st. Wait. Yeah, 61st anniversary of uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, the start of it, anyways. Oh. Right. <laughs> the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, also known as the October Crisis of 1962 uh, in Cuba, or the Missile Scare, uh, was a 13-day confrontation between the United States and Soviet Union when American deployments of nuclear missiles in Italy and Turkey were matched by Soviet deployments of nuclear missiles in Cuba. Soviet Union is like, you want to put... Nukes right by my con gym, I put them right by yours. You did. The crisis lasted from October 16th to October 28th, 1962. Confrontation is widely considered the closest the Cold War came to escalate into full scale nuclear war. Mm. Let's take a look at some of the background and the Kobe, uh, Kobe, the Cuba Soviet relations. You can look at the main article called Escalante Affair. Mm. Late 61, Fidel Castro asked for more SA 2 anti aircraft missiles from the Soviet Union. The request is not acted upon by the Soviet leadership, though. The interval, Fidel Castro began criticizing the Soviets for lack of revolutionary boldness and began talking to China about agreements for economic assistance. Oh, shit. March of 62, Fidel Castro ordered the ousting of Anibal Escalante and his pro-Moscow comrades from Cuba's Integrated Revolutionary Organizations. Ooh, I didn't mean- he said, I'm getting all you uh, Soviets out of my country. Right. That's a fair alarm, the old Soviet leadership, as well as fears of a possible United States invasion. In this crisis of international relations, the Soviet Union sent more to, sent more SA-2 anti-aircraft missiles in April, as well as a regiment of regular Soviet troops. Sam? I don't know if Cuba wanted the troops. So, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Timothy Neftali has contended that Escalante dismissal was a motivating factor behind the Soviet decision to place nuclear missiles in Cuba in 1962. According to Neftali, Soviet foreign policy planners were consigned that Castro's break with Escalante foreshadowed a Cuban drift toward China and sought to solidify the Soviet-Cuban relationship through the missile basing program. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I guess we got to. What is the old Cuban-U.S. relations at this time? We can take a look at further information. Operation 40, the Bay of Pigs invasion, and Operation Mongoose. The Cuban government regarded U.S. imperialism as the primary explanation for the island's structural weaknesses. The U.S. government had provided arms, money, and its authority to the Batista dictatorship. And then Fidel Castro said, Batista, you got to go. The majority of the Cuban population had tired of the severe socio-economic problems associated with the U.S. domination of the country. The Cuban government was aware of the necessity of ending the turmoil and incongruities of U.S.-dominated pre-revolution Cuban society. Oh. It determined that the U.S. government's demands made as part of the hostile U.S. reaction to Cuban government policy were unacceptable. Ooh, very, very unacceptable. He said, <sighs> unacceptable. And then they're like, from here on out, you will only have 1955 Chevys in your country. <laughs> yes. <laughs> With the end of World War II and the start of the Cold War, the United States government sought to promote private enterprise as an instrument for advancing United States strat- strategic interests in the developing world. They had grown concerned about the expansion of communism. December 1959, under the Eisenhower administration, less than 12 months after the Cuban Revolution, the Central Intelligence Agency, which is the CIA, developed a plan for paramilitary action against Cuba. The CIA recruited operatives on the island to carry out terrorism and sabotage. I'm sure they did. To murder civilians and to cause economic damage. Oh, yeah, wow. Makes sense. At the initiative of the CIA Deputy Director of... Now, that sounds familiar of today's events. <laughs> All right. At the initiative of the CIA Deputy Director for Plans, Richard Bissell, Bissell? Yeah, Richard Bissell, and approved by the new President OJFK, the United States launched the attempt Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba in April 1961. Uh, yeah. It used CIA trains, trained forces of Cuban expatriates. The complete failure of the invasion and the exposure of the U.S. government role before the operation began was a source of diplomatic embarrassment for the administration. Damn. Afterward, former President Eisenhower told Kennedy that the failure of the Bay of Pigs will embolden the Soviets to do something that they, that, that they would not otherwise do. I'm sure they were thinking about it. Right. Following the failed invasion, the U.S. massively escalated its sponsorship of terrorism against Cuba. (laughs) Oh, shit. Late 61, using the military and the CIA, the U.S. government engaged in an extensive campaign of state-sponsored terrorism against civilian and military targets on the island. Wow. Wow. And JFK, (laughs) so great, remember? Right. The terrorist attacks killed a significant number of civilians. The United States armed, trained, and funded and directed the terrorists, most of whom were Cuban expatriates. 
the tourists. <laughs> oh, knucklehead. <laughs> oh, knucklehead <laughs> tourists. Knucklehead tourists. <laughs> Terrorist attacks were planned at the direction and with the participation of United States government employees and launched from the United States territory. January 1962, United States Air Force General Edward Lansdale described the plans to overthrow the Cuban government in a top-secret report addressed to Kennedy and officials involved with Operation Mongoose. CIA agents, or Pathfinders, from the Special Activities Division, they were to be infiltrated into the Cuba into Cuba to try to carry out sabotage and organization, including radio broadcasts. Okay. February nineteen sixty two. Just go up there and mess shit up or down there, right? All right, down. February nineteen sixty two, the US launched an embargo against Cuba, and Lansdale presented a twenty six page top secret timetable for implementation of the overthrow of the Cuban government, mandating guerrilla operations to begin in August and September. Open revolt and overthrow of the communist regime was hoped by the planners to occur in the first two weeks of October. October. Terrorism campaign and the threat of invasion were crucial factors in the Soviet decision to position the missiles on Cuba and in the Cuban government's decision to accept. The United States government was aware at the time, as reported to the president in a national intelligence estimate, that the invasion threat was a key reason for Cuban acceptance of the missiles. No shit. Right. Like, hey, we're threatening to, we've already proved that we're trying to take this guy out, so of course they're going to accept Soviet help. Right. Let's take a look at the United States and Soviet relations. When Kennedy ran for the old president of the United States in 1960, one of his key election issues was an alleged missile gap with the Soviets. In fact... The United States at the time led the Soviets by a wide margin, which would only increase over time. Year 1961, the Soviets had only four R-7 Samaralka intercontinental ballistic missiles, the ICBMs. By October 1962, some intelligence estimates indicated a figure of 75. Holy shit. The United States, on the other hand, had 170 of those bastards laying around and was quickly building more. It also had eight George Washington and Ethan Allen class ballistic missile submarines. Ooh. With the, I bet you Russia had some too, and they didn't know about it. With the capability to launch 16 Polaris missiles, each with a range of 2,500 nautical miles, with its 4,600 4, kilometers for the rest of the world. Wow. <laughs> Khrushchev increased the perception of a missile gap when he loudly boasted to the world that the Soviets were building missiles like sausages. No! But Soviet missiles' numbers and capabilities were nowhere close to his assertions. Soviet Union Giant had dildos. <laughs> right. The Soviet Union had medium range ballistic missiles in quantity, about seven hundred of those, but they were unreliable and inaccurate. Mm. The US had a considerable advantage in its total number of nuclear warheads. They had twenty seven thousand against three thousand six hundred for mm. the Soviets. Now what you need is one, right? Right. <laughs> You would think. <laughs> and then the technology required for their accurate delivery as well. They had nothing. So they're like North Korea back then. All right. The U.S. also led in missile defense capabilities, naval and air power. However, the Soviets held a two to one advantage in conventional ground forces. Of course. More pronounced in field guns and tanks, particularly in the European theater. Well, yeah. I can get those tanks and shit to the United States. Right. Not going to happen. We all know that Russia will send 100,000 troops out towards you with. Another 100,000 ready to go. Soviet First Secretary Nikita Khrushchev, Khrushchev? Nikita Khrushchev also had an impression of Kennedy as weak, which to him was confirmed by the president's response during the Berlin crisis of 1961, particularly to the building of the Berlin Wall by East Germany to prevent its citizens from em emigrating to the West. Who knocked the wall down? Reagan. Reagan. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. The half-hearted nature of the Bay of Pigs invasion reinforced Khrushchev, Khrushchev and his vi advisors' impression that Kennedy was indecisive. As one Soviet aide wrote, he says, too young, intellectual, not prepared well for decision-making in a crisis situation, too intelligent and too weak. Damn, you can be too intelligent and too weak? Mm, too smart for your own good? You ever uh, heard that? Yeah. Speaking to Soviet officials in the aftermath of the crisis, Khrushchev asserted, I know for certain that Kennedy doesn't have a strong background. Nor, generally speaking, does he have the courage to stand up to a serious challenge. Ooh. I'm fighting words. He also told his son, Sergey, that one day he'll play for Detroit Red Wings and win four Stanley Cups. <laughs> Sergey Khrushchev? <laughs> <laughs> he also told Sergey that on Cuba, Kennedy would make a fuss, make more of a fuss, and then agree. May 1962, Soviet First Secretary Nikita Khrushchev was persuaded by the idea of countering the U.S.'s growing lead in developing and deploying strategic missiles, missiles by placing Soviet intermediate-range nuclear missiles in Cuba, despite the misgivings of the Soviet ambassador in Havana, Alexander Ivanovich Alexiev, who argued that Castro would not accept the deployment of the missiles. Khrushchev faced a strategic situation in which the U.S. was perceived to have a splendid first-strike capability that put the Soviet Union at a huge disadvantage. 
1962, Soviets had only 20 ICBMs capable of delivering nuclear warheads to the U.S. from inside the Soviet Union. I don't understand what they're thinking here anyway. If nuclear war did pop out, they're hitting Cuba first and they're done. Right. So why would even Cuba even want that? And wipe out the whole damn place. They're like they're gonna hit Cuba with their own nuke, right. exploding the other nukes that are in Cuba, <laughs> and then take out basically the whole right. uh, Caribbean. Oh my! Now, the poor accuracy and reliability of the missiles raised serious doubts about their effectiveness. A newer, more reliable generations of ICBMs would become operational, operational only after 1965. Mm. Therefore, Soviet nuclear capability 1962 placed less emphasis on ICBMs than on medium and intermediate range ballistic missiles. The missiles could hit American allies and most of Alaska from Soviet territory, but not the contiguous United States, obviously. Uh, Graham Allison, the director of Harvard University's Belfer uh, Center for Science and International Affairs, he points out the Soviet Union could not right the nuclear imbalance by deploying new ICBMs on its own soil. In order to meet the threat it faced in 1962, 1963, and 1964, it had very few options. Moving existing nuclear weapons to locations from which they could reach American targets was one. Well, I would assume a second reason Soviet missiles were deployed to Cuba was that Khrushchev wanted to bring West Berlin, controlled by the American, British, and French within communist East Germany, into Soviet o- orbit. Oh, true. The East Germans and Soviets considered Western control over a portion of Berlin a grave threat to East Germany. Wow. Khrushchev made West Berlin the central battlefield of the Cold War. Oh. Khrushchev believed that if the U.S. did nothing over the missile deployments in Cuba, he could muscle the West out of Berlin using a- said missiles as a deterrent to Western countermeasures in Berlin. Wouldn't it be a cold a cold battle? <laughs> cold battlefield? If the U.S. tried to bargain with the Soviets after he became aware of the missiles, Khrushchev could demand trading the missiles for West Berlin. That's what he's thinking here. Huh? Uh, that's what he's thinking. Since Berlin was strategically more important than Cuba... The trade would be a win for Khrushchev, as Kennedy recognized. Kennedy said this, The advantage is, from Khrushchev's point of view, he takes a great chance, but there are quite some rewards to it. Thirdly, from the perspective of the Soviet Union and of Cuba, it seemed that the United States wanted to increase its presence in old Cuba. In view of actions, including the attempt to expel Cuba from the Organization of American States, placing economic sanctions on the nation, uh, directly invading it, <laughs> and the outgoing, the ongoing campaign of terrorism and sabotage the CIA was carrying out against the island. Cuban officials understood that America was trying to overrun Cuba. No, no shit. shit. As a result, to try to prevent this, the USSR would place missiles in Cuba and neutralize the threat. This would ultimately serve to secure Cuba against an attack and keep the country in the socialist bloc. All right. Another major reason why Khrushchev planned to place missiles in Cuba undetected was to level the playing field with the evident American nuclear threat. Mm. America had the upper hand as they could launch from Turkey and destroy the USSR before they would have a chance to react. Dude, think about that. Wow. After the emplacement of nuclear missiles in Cuba, Khrushchev had finally established mutual assured destruction, meaning that if the United States decided to launch, they're going to launch, and both the United States and Russia are fucked. <laughs> right. Finally, placing nuclear missiles on Cuba was a way for the USSR to show their support for Cuba and support the Cuban people who viewed the United States as a threatening force, as the latter had become their ally after the Cuban Revolution of 1959. According to Khrushchev, the Soviet Union's motives were aimed to allow Cuba to live peacefully and develop it and develop as a people of desire. Aimed to allow Cuba to live peacefully and develop as its people desire. So not at all. <laughs> right. Schlesinger, a historian and advisor to Kennedy, he told the National Public Radio in an interview on the 16th of October in 2002 that Castro did not want the missiles, but Khrushchev pressured Castro to accept them because he was probably thinking, dude, if something happens, we're done. Castro was not completely happy with the idea, but Cuba National Dictator of the Revolution accepted them, both to protect Cuba against the U.S. and to aid the Soviet Union. All right, let's take a look at some of the Soviet military deployments. Early 1962, a group of Soviet military and missile construction specialists accompanied an agricultural delegation to Havana. They obtained a meeting with Cuban Prime Minister Fidel Castro. The Cuban leadership had a strong expectation that the U.S. would invade Cuba again and enthusiastically approve the idea of installing nuclear missiles in Cuba. I thought he wasn't really that fond of it. Right. According to another source, Castro objected to the missiles deployment as making him look like a Soviet puppet. Oh, you But he was like persuaded that. that the missiles in Cuba would be an irritant to the U.S. and help the interests of the entire socialist camp. The deployment would include short-range tactical weapons with a range of 40 kilometers, usable only against naval vessels, that would provide a nuclear umbrella for attacks upon the island. Right. Mm. Take out these ships while we're deploying right. the big boys. By May, Khrushchev and Castro agreed to place strategic nuclear missiles secretly in Cuba. Like Castro, Khrushchev felt that the United States invasion of Cuba was imminent and that to lose Cuba would be do great harm to the communists, especially in Latin America. 
He said he wanted to confront the Americans with more than words. More than words. The logical answer was missiles. <laughs> it always is. All right. The Soviets maintained their tight secrecy, writing their plans longhand, which were approved by Marshal of the Soviet Union, Rodion uh, Melovinsky, on the 4th of July, and Khrushchev approved it on the 7th of July. From the very beginning, the Soviet operation entailed elaborate denial and deception known as Maskarovka. Maskarova? Maskarovka? Maskarovka? Maskarovka. 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 All the planning and preparation for transporting and deploying the missiles were carried out in the utmost secrecy, with only a few very with only a very few told the exact nature of the mission. Even the troops detailed for the mission were given misdirection by being told that they were headed for a cold region and being outfitted with ski boots, fleece line parkas, and other winter equipment. Fantastic. Like, dude, aren't even, <laughs> they didn't even pack anything that was, they're going to be sweating in Cuba now. Back sweatpants. <laughs> they, they look like idiots. Sweatshirts and pants. <laughs> they look like idiots. Fleece line parkas. Uh, the Soviet code name was Operation Anadir. The Anadir River flows into the Bering Sea, and Anadir is also the capi- capi- capital of Chuck Chuck. Chukotsky District and a bomber base in the far eastern region. All of the measures were meant to conceal the program from both internal and external audiences. Yeah, look, nobody was going to pay attention to this shit. Right. Specialists in missile construction under the guise of machine operators and agricultural specialists arrived in July. A total of 43,000 foreign troops would ultimately be brought in. Chief Marshal of Artillery Sergei Berazov, he headed the Soviet rocket forces and led a team that visited Cuba. My survey team. He told Khrushchev that the missiles would be concealed and camouflaged by palm trees. Palm trees don't camouflage nothing. Mm. <laughs> I guess if there's a bunch of them somewhere, right. like a little clump of trees. That's early, and they're like super tall broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as early as August 1962, the United States suspected the Soviets of building missile facilities in Cuba. During that month, as intelligence services gathered information about sightings by ground observers of Soviet-built MIG-21 fighters and IL-28 light bombers, U-2 spy planes found S-75 Divina, which is NATO designation SA-2, uh, surfaced to air missile sites at eight different locations. Oh, they were fighting all kinds of military. Uh, yep. CIA Director John A. McCone was suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> Sending anti-aircraft missiles into Cuba, he reasoned, made I got sense. Russia and Cuba with the missiles <laughs> <laughs> in the uh, in the Cuba <laughs> in the Cuba with the missiles. Right. Uh, right. Sending anti-aircraft missiles into Cuba, he reasoned, made sense only if Moscow intended to use them to shield a base for ballistic missiles aimed at the United States. August 10th, he wrote, he wrote a memo to Kennedy in which he guessed that the Soviets were preparing to introduce ballistic missiles into Cuba. Uh-oh. Che Guevara himself traveled to the Soviet Union on August 30th, 1962, to sign off on the final agreement regarding the deployment of the missiles in Cuba. Oh. The visit was heavily monitored by the CIA as Guevara had gained more scrutiny by American intelligence. I bet it was. Yeah. While in the Soviet Union, Guevara argued with Khrushchev that the missile deal should be made public, but Khrushchev insisted on total secrecy and swore the Soviet Union support if the Americans discovered the missiles. He's like, they're fine with it. We'll, we'll be like, hey, caught us. Oh, they're ours. Plus, you can't mistake the right. Russian written on all of them. But it's, No, they probably put Cuban on them. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Property of Cuba. <laughs> what the hell? Not they, Russia. They, they, <laughs> <laughs> it's not Russia. And by the time Guevara arrived in Cuba, the United States had already discovered the Soviet troops in Cuba via the U-2 spy planes. Oh. With important congressional elections scheduled for November, the crisis became enmeshed in American politics. October 31st, Senator Kenneth Keating from New York, he was a Republican, he warned on the Senate floor that Soviet Union was in all probability constructing a missile base in Cuba. He charged the Kennedy administration with covering up a major threat to the United States, thereby starting the crisis. Damn. He may have received this initial remarkably accurate information from his friend, former Congresswoman and Ambassador Claire Booth Luce, who in turn received it from Cuban exiles. Mm. A later confirmed and source for Keating's information possibly was the West German ambassador to Cuba, who had received information from dissidents inside Cuba that Soviet troops had arrived. And plus, at this time, uh, wasn't the mobsters like working with the CIA and FBI and trying all that take, shit? Trying to take out Fidel, yeah. All right, so they got information there. Like, dude, there's some shit going on. So. Well, I don't the mobsters had any idea mm. that fucking missiles were getting built. Mm. Weren't they in Cuba then? Yeah, they're in Cuba because Fidel was trying to push him out. Or did he already push him out? 
mm-hmm. the sixties. Yeah, they're already at home, so you know, they didn't know. <laughs> He says that Soviet troops had arrived in August and were seen working in all probability on or near a missile base. Or near. <laughs> uh, and who passed this information to Keating on a trip to Washington in early October as this West German ambassador guy. Uh, Air Force General Curtis LeMay presented a pre-invasion bombing plan to Kennedy in September. And spy flights and minor military harassment from U.S. forces at Guantanamo Bay Naval Base were the subject of continual Cuban diplomatic complaints to the government oh. of the United States. Fantastic, huh? The first consignment of Soviet R-12 missiles arrived on the night of the 8th of September, 1962, Two. followed by a second on the September 16th. The R-12 was a medium-range ballistic missile capable of carrying a thermonuclear warhead. Oh, great. It was a single-stage road-transportable, surface-launched, storable, liquid-propellant-fueled missile that could deliver a megaton-class nuclear weapon. Oh, excellent. <laughs> I'm talking about the granddaddy, right? Almost? Mm, no. The Soviets were building nine sites, six for R-12 medium-range missiles and uh, with an effective range of 2,000 kilometers, which is 1,200 miles. And they were building three sites for R-14 intermediate-range ballistic missiles that could uh, do 4,500 kilometers, which is 2,800 miles. Peace. October 7th, Cuban President Osvaldo Dordicos Torado spoke, spoke at the UN General Assembly. He says, if we are attacked, we would defend ourselves. I repeat, we have sufficient means in with, with which to defend ourselves. We have indeed our inevitable weapons, the weapons, which we would have. The, the weapons, some say they're the best weapons. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> which we would have preferred not to acquire and which we do not wish to employ. Oh, jeez. Uh, okay. October 10th. So you're basically saying. We have weapons <laughs> from somebody, right. but who? October 10th, in another Senate speech, Senate Keating reaffirmed his earlier warning of August 31st and stated that construction has begun on at least a half dozen launching sites for intermediate range oh, tactical missiles. Oh, shit. Wow. The Cuban leadership was further upset when on the 20th of September, the United States Senate approved Joint Resolution 230, which expressed the United States was determined to prevent in Cuba the creation or use of an externally supported military capability endangering the security of the United States, well, obviously. On that very same day of the September 20th, the United States announced a major military exercise in the Caribbean. It was called the uh, Fibrixlex 62, P-H-I-B-R-I-G-L-E-X-62, which Cuba denounced as a deliberate provocation and proof that the United States plan to invade their little country. Mm. Soviet leadership believed, based on its perception of Kennedy's lack of confidence during the Bay of Pigs invasion, that he would avoid confrontation and accept the missiles as fate accompli. Whatever that means. Uh, September 11th, oh, the Soviet Union publicly warned that a U.S. attack on Cuba or on Soviet ships that were carrying supplies to the island would mean war. Soviets continued the Mashkarovka program to conceal their actions in Cuba. Right. They repeatedly denied that the weapons being brought into Cuba were offensive in nature. <laughs> okay. Well, claiming they're like defensive missile defense and shit. Yeah. <coughs> September 7th, Soviet ambassador to the United States... Anatoly Dobrynin assured United States ambassador to the United Nations, uh, Adelaide Stevenson, that the United or the Soviet Union was supplying only defensive weapons to Cuba. Liars. All right. September 11th, the Telegraph Agency of the Soviet Union announced that the Soviet Union had no need or an intention to introduce offensive nuclear missiles in Cuba. I'm like, why would we want to do that? October 13th. Dobrynin was questioned by former Undersecretary of State Chester Balls about whether the Soviets planned to put offensive weapons in Cuba. He denied any such plans. 17th of October, Soviet embassy official Georgi Bolshakov, he brought President Kennedy a personal message from Khrushchev, reassuring him that under no circumstances would surface-to-surface missiles be sent to Cuba. (laughs) These guys are just straight up lying. His pants were smoking. Right. Well, let's take a look at the missiles being reported. Missiles in Cuba allowed the Soviets to effectively target most of the continental U.S. Mm. The planned arsenal was 40 launchers. Damn. The Cuban populace readily noticed the arrival and deployment of the missiles, and hundreds of reports reached Miami. I'm sure. U.S. intelligence received countless reports, many of dubious quality or even laughable, right. most of which could be dismissed as describing defensive missiles. Only five reports bothered the analysts, though. They described large trucks passing through the towns at night that were carrying very long canvas-colored cylindrical objects that could not make turns through towns without backing up and maneuvering. Oh, wow. Holy shit. It's like... Um, and the streets in Cuba do are 
a very narrow. It's, it's like trying to transport a f- windmill blade. <laughs> right. Uh, defensive missile transporters, it was believed, could make such turns without undue difficulty. Right. The reports could not be satisfactorily dismissed. They're like, something's going on here, guys. You ain't kidding. Well, the United States was like, we need to get that bird in the sky, boys. Mm-hmm. United States had been sending U-2 surveillance over Cuba since the failed Bay of the, Bay of the Pigs evasion. The first issue that led to a pause in reconnaissance flights took place on the 30th of August, 1962, when a U-2 operated by the United States Air Force Strategic Air Command flew over the Sakhalin Island in the Soviet Far East by mistake. Mm. Ooh, the Soviets lodged a protest in the United States apology. <laughs> like, oh, so sorry, so sorry. I'd be like, hey, man, this time it was on accident. I'm sorry, so sorry. There's nothing there anyway. <laughs> right, forgive us. <laughs> right. Nine days later, a Taiwanese-operated U-2 was lost over western China to an SA-2 surface-to-air missile. Oh, oh, no. United States officials were worried that one of the Cuban or Soviet SAMs, which is the surface-to-air missile, in Cuba might shoot down a CIA U-2, initiating another international incident. He's like, Shit. I don't think they're going to shoot down. Mm-hmm. Well, in a meeting with members of the Committee on Overhead Reconnaissance, uh, on September 10th, Secretary of State Dean Rusk and National Security Advisor Mick George Bundy heavily restricted further U-2 flights over Cuban airspace. Mm. The result in lack of coverage over the island for the next five weeks became known to historians as the photo gap. Really? No significant U-2 coverage was achieved over the interior of the island. U.S. officials attempted to use a Corona photo reconnaissance satellite to obtain coverage over reported Soviet military deployments, but imagery acquired over Western Cuba by a Corona KH-4 mission October 1st was heavily covered by clouds and haze and failed to provide any usable intelligence. Stupid. You got to get those planes over there, man. Stupid. Too bad uh, they don't have those um, stealth drones and shit like they got nowadays. Right. At the end of September, Navy reconnaissance aircraft photographed the Soviet ship Kazimov with large crates on its deck, the size and shape of IL-28 jet bomber fuselage. Oh, they already know what it looks like, huh? September 1962, analysts from the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is DIA, it noticed that Cuban surface-to-air missile sites were arranged in a pattern similar to those used by the Soviet Union to protect its ICBM bases leading DIA to lobby for the resumption of the U-2 flights over the island. He's like, we need to do it. Cuba's like, yeah, man, go ahead and do this here, but don't make it look like how you guys build your bases. They're like, okay, we won't. We <laughs> Although in the past, the flights had been conducted by the CIA. Pressure from the defense department led to the authority being transferred to the Air Force. Like, why don't you let the real people do it? CIA. Right. Following the loss of the CIA U-2 over the Soviet Union in May of 1960, it was thought, that if another U-2 were shot down, an Air Force aircraft arguably being used for a legitimate military purpose would be easier to explain than a CIA flight. Right. Well, like, what's the CIA uh, doing flying shit over here? Right. Uh, How did they get away with the one in 1960? I don't know. When the reconnaissance missions were reauthorized on October 9th, poor weather kept the planes from flying. The U.S. first obtained U-2 photographic evidence of the missiles on October 14th, when a U-2 flight piloted by Major Richard Heiser took 928 pictures on a path selected by DIA analysts, capturing images of what turned out to be an SS-4 construction site at San Cristobal, Pinar del Rio province, which is now in the Artemisa province in western Cuba. Dude, they must have some pretty damn good cameras in well, that's what it looked like. Still in a moving plane. I don't know how they decipher this is bases and shit from this. I don't think I got pictures of it before. I mean, I guess, but how do you see any of that? Like, what the hell? Right. I guess they know what they're looking for, I guess. Like, did you see that? No. Like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, I'm, not, I'm not in therapy. What is this? <laughs> it was a baseball mitt. <laughs> <laughs> Reminds me of times in the backyard with my pop. October 15th. Let's take a look at the president when he was notified. 15th October, CIA's National Photographic Interpretation Center reviewed the U-2 photographs, identified objects that they interpreted as medium-range ballistic missiles. The identification was made in part on the strength of reporting provided by Oleg Penkovsky, a double agent in the GRU working for the CIA and the MI6. Oh, shit. That's that's a song or something. Although he provided no direct reports of the Soviet missile deployments to Cuba, Technical and doctrinal details of the Soviet missiles regiments that had been provided by Pinkovsky in the months and years prior to the crisis it helped the, NI, the NPIC analyst correctly identify the missiles on the U-2 imagery. Really? 
That evening, the CIA notified the Department of State, and at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Bundy chose to wait until the next morning to tell the president. Why? He's up. He's like, I think Marilyn's with him right now. Uh, McNamara was briefed at midnight. Okay. Next morning. Song? No, it's after midnight. Right. <laughs> briefed at midnight. <laughs> the next morning, Bundy met with Kennedy and showed him the YouTube photographs and briefed him on the CIA's analysis YouTube? of that the YouTube images. YouTube back then, eh? YouTube photos? Yeah. 6.30 p.m. <laughs> Kennedy convened a meeting of the nine members of the National Security Council and five other key advisors in a group he formally named the Executive Committee of the National Security Council. <laughs> All right, Mayor Quimby. Uh, that's, what, that's what he sounds like. That's Mayor Quimby is supposed to be modeled after. Without informing the members of XCOM, President Kennedy tape recorded all their proceedings. Oh, we can't do that. And Sheldon M. Stern, head of the Kennedy Library, transcribed some of them. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Why oh. you gotta transcribe them? They're in English. All right. 16th October, President Kennedy notified Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Uh, he said that he was convinced that the Soviets were placing missiles in Cuba. He goes, man, they're they're taking them there, bud. It was a legitimate threat too. This made the threat of nuclear destruction by two world superpowers a reality. Robert Kennedy responded by contacting the Soviet ambassador Anatoly Dobrynin. Uh, he expressed his concern about what was happening in Dobrynin. He was instructed by Soviet Chairman Nikita Khrushchev. Khrushchev to pressure President Kennedy that there would be no ground to ground missiles or offensive weapons placed in Cuba. Hmm. He's like, they're just telling me there, there's nothing there, guy. I think you're crazy, brother. Right. Brother. Khrushchev, he further assured Kennedy that the Soviet Union had no intention of disrupting the relationship of our two countries, he said, despite the photo evidence presented before President Kennedy. He's like, what's this? He's like, <laughs> what the fuck is this, huh? I don't know what the fuck <laughs> Cubans are up to. No, you tell me. What is it? <laughs> no, you, U.S. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look at some responses considered. The U.S. had the U.S. had no plan in place because until recently, its intelligence had been convinced Soviets would never install nuclear missiles in Cuba. <laughs> XCOM discussed several possible courses of action. Number one, do nothing. American vulnerability to Soviet missiles was not new. Number two, diplomacy. Use diplomatic pressure to get the Soviet Union to remove the missiles. Number three, a secret approach. Offer Castro the offer Castro the choice of splitting with the Soviets or being invaded. Ooh, that's a good one. Number four, invasion. Ooh. Full force invasion of Cuba and overthrow of Castro. Number five, airstrike. Well, yeah, let's blow up some nuclear. Use the U.S. Air Force to attack all known missile sites. Damn, that's murder. Or number six, blockade. Use the U.S. Navy to block any missiles from arriving in Cuba, which that's the one they went with, <laughs> thankfully. Right. They're lucky, though. The Joint Chiefs of Staff unanimously agreed that a full-scale attack and invasion would only, what? <laughs> was the only solution. It's like, we got to go, baby. They believed that the Soviets would not attempt to stop the United States from conquering Cuba. And Kennedy, he was very skeptical. He says, they, no more than we, can let these things go by without doing something. Right. They can't, after all their statements, permit us to take out their missiles, kill, or, kill a lot of Russians, and then do nothing. Right. If they're... If they don't take action in Cuba, they certainly will in Berlin, which is true. Kennedy concluded that attacking Cuba by air would signal the Soviets to presume an, a, a clear line to conquer Berlin. Kennedy also believed that the United States allies would think of the country as a trigger-happy cowboys who lost Berlin because they could not peacefully resolve the Cuban situation. Right. Mm. Those little trigger-happy cowboys over there. Right. Well, the XCOM then discussed the effect on the strategic balance of power, both political and military. Joint Chiefs of Staffs. The Joint Chiefs of Staff believed that the missiles would seriously alter the military balance, but McNamara disagreed. An extra 40, he reasoned, would make little difference to the overall strategic balance. The USA already had approximately 5,000 strategic warheads, oh. but the Soviet Union had only 300. Oh. McNamara concluded that the Soviets having 340 would not therefore substantially alter the strategic balance. Oh. Well, yeah. In 1990, he reiterated... That it made no difference. The military balance wasn't changed. I didn't believe it then, and I don't believe it now, he said. Oh, look at that shit. I mean, which is true. Which right. is, but those other 300 couldn't hit the continental United States, though, buddy. Right. The XCOM agreed that the missiles would affect their political balance. Kennedy had explicitly promised the American people less than a month before the crisis that if Cuba would possess a capacity to carry out offensive against the United States, the United States would act. Further, the United States' credibility among its allies and people would be damaged if the Soviet Union appeared to have redressed its strategic imbalance by placing missiles in Cuba. Well, they did, though. Kennedy explained after the crisis that it would have politically changed the balance of power. It would have appeared to, in appearances, contribute to reality. 
contribute. Okay. Uh, October 18th, Kennedy met with Soviet Minister of Foreign Affairs, Andre Gromyko, who claimed the weapons were for defensive purposes only. We're not buying it anymore, guy. Not wanting to expose what he already knew and to avoid panic in the American public, Kennedy did not reveal that he was already aware of the missile buildup. Mm. By October 19th, frequent U-2 spy flights showed four operational sites. Operational sites. Mm. That's rough. Two operational plans were considered. Operational Plan 316 envisioned a... Eh, don't trust anyone who bitches. Envisioned a full invasion of Cuba by Army and Marine units, supported by the Navy, following the Air Force, and then naval, naval airstrikes. Army units in the United States would have had... Uh, Army units in the U.S. would have trouble fielding mechanized and logistical assets, and the United States Navy could not supply enough amphibious shipping to transport even the modest armored contingent from the Army. Right. Uh, old Plan 312, primarily an Air Force and Navy carrier operation, was designed with enough flexibility to do anything from engaging individual missiles uh, to providing air support for Old Plan 316's ground forces. Mm. Okay. All right, well, let's take a look at the blockade. Kennedy met with members of XCOM and other top advisors through October 21st, considering two remaining options, an airstrike primarily against the Cuban Missile Basis or a naval blockade of Cuba. Full-scale invasion was not the administration's first option. McNamara supported the naval blockade as a strong but limited military action that left the U.S. in control. The term blockade was problematic. According to the international law, a blockade is an act of war. Oh, but the Kennedy administration did not think the Soviets would be provoked to attack by a mere blockade. Right. Why would they? Right. Additionally, they're legal. already like in deep shit for having missiles there. They're not going to be like, well. Right. Well, additionally, legal experts of the State Department and Justice Department concluded that a declaration of war could be avoided if another legal justification based on the Rio Treaty for defense of the Western Hemisphere was obtained from a resolution by two-thirds vote from the members of the Organization of American States. Admiral George Anderson, Chief Naval Operations, wrote a positions paper that uh, helped Kennedy to differentiate between uh, what they termed a quarantine of offensive weapons and a blockade of all materials, claiming that a classic blockade was not the original intention. Mm -hmm. Oh, Okay. Well, since it would take place on international waters, Kennedy obtained the approval of the OAS for military action under the hemispheric defense provisions of the Rio Treaty which Latin American participation in the quarantine now involved two Argentine destroyers, which were to report to the U.S. commander South Atlantic at Trinidad on November 9th. An Argentine submarine and a Marine battalion with lift were available if required. In addition, two Venezuelan destroyers, which were destroyers ARVD-11 Nueva Esparta and ARVD-21 Zulia, and one submarine, which was the Caribe, or the Carib, had reported to the uh, commander South Atlantic. Ready for sea by November 2nd. Dang. Look at these guys, right? The government of Trinidad and Tobago offered the use of the Chagaramas naval base to warships of any OAS nation for the duration of the quarantine. Dominican Quote, unquote. So right. It's not a blockade. <laughs> Dominican Republic had made available one escort ship. Look at these guys. They don't want no damn nukes there either. Nope. Colombia was reportedly ready to furnish units and had sent military officers to the United States to discuss assistance. The Argentine Air Force informally offered three SA-16 aircraft in addition to forces already committed to the quarantine operation. This initially was to involve a naval blockade against offensive weapons within the framework of the Organization of American States and the Rio Treaty. Such a blockade might be expanded to cover all types of goods and transports. All right. The action was to be backed up by surveillance of Cuba as well. The CNO scenario was followed closely in later implementing the quarantine. Oh. October 19th, the XCOM formed separate working groups to examine the airstrike and blockade options, and by the afternoon, must, most support in the XCOM had shifted to a blockade. Reservations about the plan continued to be voiced as late as October 21st, the paramount concern being that once the blockade was put into effect, Soviets would rush to complete some of the missiles. Uh oh Consequently, the USA could find itself bombing operational missiles if the blockade did not force Khrushchev to remove the missiles already on the island. Yeah, that's a big situation here. Well... Big one. Speech to the old nation. Got, let citizens know. 3 p.m. Eastern, October 22nd, 1962. My fellow Americans, President, I'm Morgan Freeman. Then, <laughs> President Kennedy formally established the Executive Committee and the National Security Action Memorandum 196. 5 o'clock p.m. He met the congressional leaders who continuously opposed a blockade and demanded a stronger response. Well, in Moscow, United States Ambassador Foy D. Kohler 
He briefed Court Khrushchev on the pending blockade and Kennedy's speech to the nation. Ambassadors around the world gave notice to a non-Eastern bloc leaders. Before the speech, United States delegations met with Canadian Prime Minister John Deffenbaker, British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, West German Chancellor Conrad Adenauer, French President Charles de Gaulle, Secretary General of the United of the Organization of American States, Jose Antonio Mora, and they all briefed them on the intelligence in the United States uh, proposed response. He's like, check what check what's about to happen here, guys. All right. Well, all were supportive of the U.S. position. Over the course of the crisis, Kennedy had daily telephone conversation with McMillan, who was publicly supportive of U.S. actions. Shortly before his speech, Kennedy telephoned former President Dwight Eisenhower. Kennedy's conversation with the former president also revealed that the two had been consulting during the Cuban Missile Crisis, Ooh, clearly. this is Eisenhower's plan. Uh, the two uh, also anticipated that Khrushchev would respond to the Western world in a manner similar to his response during the Suez Crisis and would possibly wind up trading off Berlin. Mm. Okay. Good thing for Eisenhower, man. Kennedy uh, was a little out of his league there. <laughs> 7 p.m. Eastern, October 22nd. Kennedy delivered a nationwide televised address on all major networks, announcing the discovery of missiles in Cuba. He noted, It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States. We cry on a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Kennedy described the administration's plans. He said to halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound to Cuba from whatever nation or port will, if found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons, be turned back. At least they're letting them turn back. All right. All right. All right. All right. I don't think so. This quarantine will be... Who's going to pay us? I don't know what to tell you. But this quarantine will be extended, if needed, to other types of cargo and carriers. We are not at this time... However, denying the necessities of life as the Soviets attempted to do in their Berlin blockade of 1948. <laughs> Throwing some shade there. <laughs> oh, it's like, no, I mean, if they want to bring food and shit, All that's right, cool. Clearly, uh, food in the shape of missiles. <laughs> <laughs> it's our new. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's our, <laughs> You guys got <laughs> subs over here? We got missiles. <laughs> we got, <right. laughs> missile sandwiches. <laughs> During the speech, a directive went out to all U.S. forces worldwide, placing them on DEFCON 3. Ooh, what is it? DEFCON 5 is like the highest or something? Right. The heavy cruiser USS Newport News was the designated flagship for the blockade, with USS Leary as Newport News' destroyer escort. Oh. Kennedy speechwriter Ted Sorensen stated in 2007 that the address to the nation was Kennedy's most important speech historically in terms of his impact on our planet. <sighs> Maybe, I guess. Right. Well, guess what? The crisis deepens. Ooh. 24th October 1962, 1124 a.m. Eastern. A cable drafted by George Wildman Ball to the United States ambassador in Turkey and NATO notified them that they were considering making an offer to withdraw the missiles from Italy and Turkey in exchange for the Soviet withdrawal from Cuba. I mean, come on, you both got to get them out of there, right? Yeah. Turkish officials replied that they would deeply resent any trade involving the United States missile presence in their country. They want the damn missiles there. <laughs> They're like, what the hell? No. So shit. Shit. <laughs> How about you point them south? <laughs> right. oh, you no, know, you just point them down to the ground. Right. <laughs> One day later, on the morning of 25th of October, 1962, American journalist Walter Lippmann proposed the same thing in a syndicated column. Castro reaffirmed Cuba's right to self-defense and said that all of his weapons were defensive and Cuba would not allow an inspection. <laughs> of course like, not. No. All right. Let's take a look at some international response. It's like somebody calling, bingo! I need to check the card. No, <laughs> no, no, man. Just, <laughs> trust me. No. Trust me. <laughs> Three days after Kennedy's speech, the Chinese People Daily announced that 650 million Chinese men and women were standing by the Cuban people. And they probably were. They are actually there standing with them. Right. <laughs> because there's so many Cuban Chinese there's like 50,000 standing by us right now. I guess, yeah. <laughs> In West Germany, newspapers supported uh, the U.S. response. <laughs> <laughs> right, we just can't see them. <laughs> I see Chinese people. <laughs> right. Dang, dang, are huge in China. Right, well, in West Germany, newspapers supported the U.S. response by contrasting it with the weak American actions in the regions during the preceding months. They also expressed some fear that the Soviets might retaliate in Berlin. In France, October 23rd, the crisis made the front page of all the daily newspapers. The next day, an editorial in La Mande expressed doubt that the authenticity of the CIA's photographic evidence. Wow. 
Two days later, after a visit by a high-ranking CIA agent, the newspaper accepted the validity of the photographs. The CIA went there. Now, listen here, damn asses. <laughs> That's just real. All right. 29th of October, issue of uh, Le Figaro, Raymond Aaron, he wrote in support of the American response. October 24th, Pope John the 23rd, he sent a message to the Soviet embassy in Rome to be transmitted to the Kremlin, in which he voices concern for peace. Nobody cares, Pope. Yeah. In this message, he stated, We beg all governments not to remain deaf to this cry of humanity, oh, okay. that, they all, that they do all that is in their power to save peace. And the children. Uh, Soviet Broadcasting Communications. Take a look at that. The crisis continued unabated. And on the evening of October 24th, Soviet TASS News Agency broadcasts a telegram from Khrushchev to Kennedy, in which Khrushchev warned that the United States' outright piracy would lead to war. Oh, war, I tell you. Khrushchev then sent a uh, at 9.24 p.m. a telegram to Kennedy, which was received at 9.52 p.m. Well, 10.52. Why is it so long? It's, it's a telegram. A, it takes a long time. <laughs> yes, Khrushchev stated, if you weigh the present situation with a cool head without giving away to passion, you understand that the Soviet Union cannot afford not to decline the despotic demands of the USA. And that the Soviet Union viewed the blockade as an act of aggression, and their warships would be instructed to ignore it. Oh, no. They wouldn't, though. <laughs> After October 23, Soviet communications with the United States increasingly showed indications of having been rushed. <laughs> what are you going to do? Right. Soviet communications were rushed, right? Right. Okay. Undoubtedly a product of pressure, it was not uncommon for Khrushchev to repeat himself and to send messages lacking basic editing. <laughs> With President Kennedy making his aggressive intentions of a possible airstrike followed by an invasion on Cuba known, Khrushchev rapidly sought a diplomatic compromise. He was like, oh, wait a minute here. Maybe they are not too weak as we thought, right? Trying to call their bluff. Communications between the two superpowers had entered into a unique and revolutionary period with the newly developed threat of mutual destruction through the deployment of nuclear weapons. Diplomacy now demonstrated how power and coercion could dominate negotiations. Well, the U.S. alert level is raised. Uh-oh, red flag, right? The U.S. requested an emergency meeting of the United Nations Security Council on October 25th. U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Adelaide Stevenson, confronted Soviet Ambassador... Adelaide Stevenson. Adelaide, boy. <laughs> he confronted Soviet Ambassador Valerian Zorin in an emergency meeting of the Security Council, challenging him to a duel. No, uh -oh. <laughs> challenging him to admit the existence of the missiles. Uh -oh. Ambassador Zorin refused to answer. 10 p.m. The, uh, uh, the next day, the U.S. raised the readiness level of strategic air command forces to DEFCON 2. Uh-oh. For the only confirmed time in U.S. history, B-52 bombers went on continuous airborne alert, and B-47 medium bombers were dispersed to various military and civilian airfields and made ready to take off, fully equipped, on 15 minutes' notice. Ooh, wee. Damn, dude, imagine that. You're just at a civilian, and get... civilian airfield, and you got B-47 bombers. Why everybody shit. was scared and doing missile tests right. in schools and well, shit. Well, that was in the 50s. Well, Same thing. It did in the 80s, I mean, 62. Yeah, maybe. One-eighth of SAC's 1,436 bombers were on airborne alert. Jeez. Some 145 intercontinental ballistic missiles stood on the ready alert yeah, as well. Dude, they're ready to blow up everybody. Mm. Some of which targeted Cuba. I would imagine. <laughs> Air Defense Command deployed 161 nuclear-armed interceptors to 16 dispersal fields within nine hours, with one-third uh, maintaining 15-minute alert status. Jeez. 23 nuclear armed B-52s were sent to orbit points within striking distance of the Soviet Union, so it would believe that the U.S. was serious. Like, damn, these we've got nukes and planes and everywhere. <laughs> Jeez. Don't forget about the ones in Turkey. <laughs> right. Jack J. Canton later estimated that about 80% of SAC's plans, SAC's planes were ready for launch during the crisis. Damn. David A. Birkenau, he recalled that, by contrast, the Russians were so thoroughly stood down and we knew it. They didn't make any move. They're like, oh, shit. <laughs> well, he continues to say <laughs> they did not increase their alert. They did not increase any flights they, or their air defense posture. They didn't do a thing. They froze in place. We were never further from nu nuclear war than a time of Cuba. Never further. October 22nd, Technical Air Command had 511 fighters plus hey. support tankers and reconnaissance aircraft. Wow. Deployed face Deploy to face Cuba on one hour alert status. Ooh. TAC and the military air transport service had problems. Oh, though. sure they did. The concentration of aircraft in Florida strained command and support echelons, Why? which faced critical undermanning in security, armaments, and communications. The absence of initial authorization for war reserve stocks of conventional munitions forced TAC to scrounge. Oh, my. And the lack of airlift assets to support a major airborne drop necessitated the call up of 24 reserve squadrons. We'll do it. Well, Shit. Well, they did. <laughs> Jackasses. 25th of October. 1.45 a.m. Eastern, 
President Kennedy responded to Khrushchev's telegram by stating that the United States was forced into action after receiving repeated assurances that no offensive missiles were being placed in Cuba. And when the assurances proved to be false, the deployment required the responses I have announced. And I hope your government will take necessary action to permit a restoration of the earlier situation. Right, you guys lied. Right. Clearly. And you got caught. Well, it's just about to get real because the blockade is challenged. 7.15 a.m. on October 25th, USS Essex, Essex and the USS Gearing attempted to intercept Bucharest but failed to do so. Which is a ship, I'm assuming. Well, Fairly certain that the tanker did not contain any military material. The U.S. allowed it through the blockade, though. Later that day, 5.43 p.m., the commander of the blockade effort ordered the destroyer USS Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. to intercept and board the Lebanese freighter Marukula. Oh. That took place the next day, and the Marukula was cleared through the blockade after its cargo was checked. Ooh. Okay. Wow. 5 p.m. Eastern, 25th of October, William Clements announced that the missiles in Cuba were still actively being worked on. <laughs> like, we don't give a shit. We got stuff here. Right. That report was later verified by a CIA report that suggested there had been no slowdown at all. In response, President Kennedy issued Security Action Memorandum 199, authorizing the loading of nuclear weapons onto aircraft under the command of SACEUR, SACEUR, SACEUR? The Security Act Memor... No. Secure? Security Act something. Secure, probably. Secure. Which had the duty of carrying out the first airstrikes on the Soviet Union. Kennedy was like, all right, we're doing this shit. Eisenhower was like, do it! <laughs> Please! <laughs> Kennedy claimed that the blockade had succeeded when the USSR turned back 14 ships, presumably carrying offensive weapons. Ooh. Mm. The first indication of this came from a report from the British GCHQ sent to the White House Situation Room containing intercepted communications from Soviet ships reporting their positions. October 24th, Kislavadsk, like Soviet cargo ship, reported a position northeast of where it had been 24 hours earlier, indicating it had discontinued its voyage and turned back towards the Baltic. Next day, reports showed more ships originally bound for Cuba had altered the course and said, fuck this. Right. We're not getting boarded. Mm-mm. All right, let's take a look at raising the stakes. Next morning, October 26, Kennedy informed the XCOM that he believed only an invasion would remove the missiles from Cuba. Mm. He was persuaded to give the matter time and continue with both military and diplomatic pressure. Okay. He agreed and ordered the low-level flights over the island to be increased from two, two per day to once every two hours. He also ordered a crash program to institute a new civil government in Cuba if an invasion went ahead. Oh. Wow. Wow. Well, at this very point, the crisis was ostensibly at its stalemate. Soviets had shown no indication that they would back down and made public media and private intergovernmental statements to that very effect. Like, we ain't backing down. I won't back down. That Tom Petty is her. A little before him. Cover man. Mm, it was before that song at least <laughs> the united states had no reason to believe otherwise and was in the early stages of preparing for an invasion along with a nuclear strike of the soviet union if it responded military uh which the united states assumed it would. i would assume so yes oh president oh president <laughs> kennedy <laughs> president, oh president kennedy had no intentions of keeping these plans a secret either with an array of cuban and soviet spies forever present Khrushchev was quickly made aware of this looming danger. Well, the implicit threat of airstrikes on Cuba followed by invasion allowed the United States to exert pressure in future talks. Mm. It was a possibility of military action that played an influential role in accelerating Khrushchev's proposal for a compromise. Throughout the closing state, yeah, because he knew at that point they weren't touching the United States. Right. Throughout the closing stages of October, Soviet communications in the United States indicated increasing, increasing defensiveness. Khrushchev's increasing tendency to use poorly phrased and ambiguous communications throughout the compromise negotiations conversely increased United States confidence and clarity in messaging. And they're like, this dude's a pussy. Right. He spent all this time calling uh, Kennedy a pussy, but then he <laughs> won, he's the one that backed down, huh? <laughs> Leading Soviet figures consistently failed to mention that only the Cuban government could agree to inspections of the territory and continually made arrangements relating to Cuba without the knowledge of Fidel Castro himself. Oh, jeez. Jeez. Yeah, they don't care about Fidel. Dude, no, these guys. <laughs> According to Dean Rusk, Khrushchev, Khrushchev blinked. He began to panic from the consequences of his own plan. And this was reflected in the tone of Soviet messages. This allowed the United States to largely dominate negotiations in late October. Well, let's take a look at some secret negotiations. Uh-oh. 1 p.m. on October 26, John A. Scally of ABC News had lunch with Alexander Fomin, or Fomin, which was the cover name of Alexander Fe- Well, you could at least change your first name. Guys. Right. Alexander Feklasov, the KGB station chief in Washington, oh. at Fomin's request. Really? 
found the instructions of the Politburo of the CPSU, which is the Communist Party of Soviet Union, the uh, Political Bureau. Okay. Central, so yeah, committee. committee. Uh, Fahman noted war seems about to break out. He asked Scali or Scali to use his contracts to talk to his high level friends mm. at the State Department to see if the U.S. would be interested in a diplomatic solution. Right. I mean, come on, man. He suggested that the language of the deal would contain an assurance from the Soviet Union to remove the weapons under U.N. supervision and that Castro would publicly announce that he would not accept such weapons again in exchange for a public statement by the U.S. It would not invade Cuba. I mean, what's wrong with that? He's like, I'll get rid of the weapons. You just don't come here. Well, let then, me, and let me uh, suppress my people for uh, the next well, 70 years. Well, then Russia's, Russia's going to be like, well, you got to take your shit out of Turkey and uh, where else do they have it? Um, Hungary, right? Yeah. I would have supposed that would be the... Thing. I mean, as about the United States, you'd be like, <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Well, that's if Turkey wants them to, though. That's true. The United States in there now. They already, we already had an earlier in the article. Turkey didn't want them to. They're like, are you kidding me? They're like, no. And I don't even, yeah. And uh, Castro didn't even want these sons of bitches. Right. So it all works out. The United States responded by asking the Brazilian government to pass a message to Castro that the United States would be unlikely to invade if the missiles were removed. Unlikely. Letter from Chairman, Chairman Khrushchev. Letterman from Chairman Khrushchev to President John F. Kennedy at the time, and it states, Mr. President, we and you ought not now to pull on the ends of the rope in which you have tied the knot of war. Ooh. Because the more the two of us pull, the tighter that knot will be tied. And it's hard to get a knot out. Mm. And a moment may come when that knot will be tied so tight that even who he who tied it will not have the strength to untie it. Well, that's why you get a fork. <laughs> <laughs> and then it will be necessary to cut that knot Ooh. and what that would mean is not for me to explain to you because you yourself understand perfectly of what terrible forces our countries dispose hmm. consequently if there's no intention to tighten that knot and thereby to doom the world to the catastrophe of thermonuclear war then let us not only relax the forces pulling on the ends of this rope let us take measures to untie that knot. We are ready for this. October 26, 1962. Hmm. Around 6 p.m. on that same day, the State Department started receiving a message that appeared to be written personally by Khrushchev. Ooh, a personally okay. written. Wow. Is that the one, apparently? Uh, it was uh, Saturday, 2 a.m. in Moscow at that time. The long letter took several minutes to arrive, and it took translators additional time to translate and transcribe it. The dude couldn't even do it in English? Right. I mean, come on. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy described the letter as a very long and emotional as very long and emotional. Right. Khrushchev reiterated the basic outline that had been stated to Scali earlier in the day. I propose we, for our part, will declare that our ships bound for Cuba are not carrying any armaments. You will declare that the United States will not invade Cuba with its troops and will not support any other forces which might intend to invade Cuba. Oh. So maybe they do like Cuba. Or maybe they knew that right. they still had to keep Cuba right. in their good graces just in case. Definitely. Right. Uh, then the necessity of the presence of our military specialists in Cuba would disappear. Yep. 6.45 p.m. News of Fahman's offer to Scali was finally heard and was interpreted as a setup for the arrival of Khrushchev's letter. The letter was then considered official and accurate, although it was later learned that Fahman was almost certainly operating of his own accord without official backing. Hey, well, the guy might have saved the world. All right. Additional study of the letter was ordered and continued into the night. I got to study this letter now. <laughs> Jeez. Wow. Okay. Well, the crisis continues. Direct aggression against Cuba would mean nuclear war. The Americans speak about such aggression as if they did not know or did not want to accept this fact. I have no doubt they would lose such a war. This came from Che Guerra, October so. uh, 1962. Don't think so there, Chi. Right. Castro, on the other hand, was convinced that an invasion of Cuba was soon at hand. And on the 26th of October, he sent a telegram to Khrushchev that appeared to call for a preemptive nuclear strike on oh. the United States in case of an attack. He's like, if they come, just nuke these sons of bitches. Nuke those bastards. Oh, you're saying do it now before they have the opportunity to do anything at all. Mm. In a 2010 interview, Castro expressed regret about his 1962 stance on first use. After I've seen what I've seen and known what I know. It wasn't worth it at all, he yeah. says. <laughs> Castro also ordered all anti-aircraft weapons in Cuba to fire on any United States aircraft. Previous orders had been to fire only on groups of two or more. Wow. 6 a.m. on October 27th, the CIA delivered a memo reporting that three of the four missile sites at San Cristobal and both sites at Sagua, Sagua La Grande appeared to be fully operational. Ooh, that's not a good sign. It was also noted that the Cuban military continued to organize for action but was under order not to initiate action unless attacked. 
9 a.m. that same day, October 27th, Radio Moscow began broadcasting a message from Khrushchev. Contrary to the letter of the night before, the message offered a new trade. The missiles on Cuba would be removed in exchange for the removal of the Jupiter missiles from Italy and Turkey. Seeing that coming. 10 a.m., the executive committee met again to discuss the situation and came to the conclusion that the change in the message was because of internal debate between Khrushchev and other party officials in the Kremlin. Mm-hmm. Everybody else around him was probably like, you idiot, you realize how weak you just made us? Right, yeah, I'm surprised he's still alive. To right. agree. Man, Russians are brutal. Well, I might be dead now, but... <laughs> President Kennedy realized that he wouldn't be in an unsupportable position if this becomes Khrushchev's proposal because the missiles in Turkey were not militarily useful and were being removed anyway, and it's going to... And uh, it's going to to any man at the United Nations or any other national man, rational man, will look like a very fair trade. So he's saying, well, let's do it. I guess. But he knew internally, I guess, that well, they're removing the, anyway, those, those missiles are worthless. So right. it's not a fair trade. Right. But to the outside, it right. looks like, uh, I guess. Bundy explained why Khrushchev's public acquiescence could not be considered. He says the current threat to peace is not in Turkey. It is in Cuba. Hmm. McNamara noted that another tanker, the Grozny, it was about 600 miles out and should be intercepted. He also noted that they had not made the Soviets aware of the blockade line and suggested relaying the information to them via the Uthant at the United Nations. Yeah, you think you should tell them, but like, hey, bud, if you see a bunch of, uh, <laughs> a bunch of ships. How would the Russia, obviously Russia knows about it. Well, while the meeting progressed at 11.30 or 11.03 a.m., a new message began to arrive from Khrushchev. The message stated in part. You, dis- you are disturbed over Cuba. You say that this disturbs you because it is 99 miles by sea from the coast of the United States of America. But that's not far at all. But you have placed destructive missile weapons, which you call offensive, in Italy and Turkey, literally next to us. I therefore make this proposal. That's like what's happening right. in Ukraine. Pretty much. That's why they wanted to prevent this, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, he says this proposal. We are willing to remove from Cuba the means which you regard as offensive. Your representatives will make a declaration to the effect that the United States will remove its anagalous means from Turkey. And after that, persons entrusted by the United Nations Security Council could inspect on the spot the fulfillment of the pledges made. I mean, what's wrong with that? The executive committee continued to meet through the day, though. You have third party come in and check that shit out? I mean, third party. (laughs) Amen. Well, throughout this very crisis, Turkey had repeatedly stated that it would be upset if the Jupiter missile was removed. Italy's Prime Minister Amatore Fanfani was also Foreign Minister ad interim. Interim right. Foreign Minister. Offered to allow withdrawal of the missiles deployed in Apulia as a bargaining chip. He's like, just get the shit over right. with, dude. <laughs> he gave the message to one of his most trusted friends, Itor Bernabe, general manager of the RAI slash TV dash TV, uh, to convey to Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr., Bernabe was in New York to attend International Conference on Satellite Television Broadcasting. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Good for him. Nice little conference. Morning of October 27th, a U-2F, which was the third CIA U-2A modified for air-to-air refueling, piloted by the United States Air Force Major Rudolph Anderson, departed its forward operating location at McCoy Air Force Base in Florida. Oh, what's this guy going to do? Oh, man. At approximately 12 p.m., the aircraft was struck. All right. <sighs> struck by a SA-2 surface-to-air missile launched from Cuba. Aircraft crash and Anderson was killed. Oh no, that's a direct threat. That's war, dude. You ain't kidding, doggy styles. Stress and negotiations between the Soviets and the U.S. intensified. No, Cuba. <laughs> Cuba, you don't want them to uh, invade you, but you do this. Right. Only later was it assumed that the decision to fire the missile was made locally by an undetermined Soviet commander. Oh, acting on his own authority. Yeah, I bet that's what they said. They probably killed, took the dude right. out back and shot him. Later that day, at about 3.41 p.m., several U.S. Navy RF-8A Crusader aircraft on low-level photo reconnaissance missions were fired upon as well. Gee, so Pete, 28th of October, 1962, Khrushchev told his son, Sergei, that the shooting down of Anderson's U-2 was by the Cuban military at direction of uh, Raul Castro. Mm. Mm. Oh, no. Jeez, this whole thing's <laughs> Well, Castro did say we're going to fire on these Wow, dude. Well, that's his brother. Um, right. This thing, I don't think many people know how close we actually got to this to, damn nuclear war, dude. To dying. Right. <laughs> I would have never been born. <laughs> you guys wouldn't even be hearing this right now. Only 5 AR, but. <laughs> 4 p.m. Eastern time. President Kennedy recalled members of XCOM to the White House, ordered that a message should be immediately be sent to Uthant, asking the Soviets to spend work on the missiles while negotiations were carried out. 
During this very meeting, General Maxwell Taylor delivered the news that the U-2 had been shot down. Oh, no. Kenny had earlier claimed he would order an attack on such sites if fired upon. But he decided uh, to not act unless another attack was made. He's oh. like, hold on here. Let's just see. Let's fly another plane over. <laughs> right, let's see what they do. <laughs> well, 40 years later, McNamara reflects. He says, we had to send a U-2 over to gain reconnaissance information on whether the Soviet missiles were becoming operational. We believed that the U-2 was shot down, that the Cubans didn't have capabilities to shoot it down. The Soviets did. We believed that if it was shot down, it would be shot down by a Soviet surface-to-air missile unit and that it would represent a decision by the Soviets to escalate the conflict. Of course. And therefore, we, uh, and therefore, before we sent the U-2 out, we agreed that if it was shot down, we wouldn't meet, we'd simply attack. Oh, you lied then. It was shot down on Friday. Fortunately, we changed our mind. We thought, well, it might have been an accident. We won't attack. Later, we learned that Khrushchev had reasoned just as we did. We send over the U-2. If it was shot down, he would reason that it would believe it was an intentional escalation. Right. And therefore, he issued orders to Plyev who was the Soviet commander in Cuba, to instruct all of his batteries to not shoot down the U-2. Oh, so, Cuba's right. doing this shit on their own. They're revolting well, against uh, Russia. Well, no, they're, they tried to blame the one guy acting right. on his own, but mm. it was a Soviet guy, though. That's true, right? Daniel Ellsberg said that Robert Robert Kennedy, uh, old I Chinese boy, brother. I don't know why it's in parentheses of RFK, but... Right. He, that Robert Kennedy told him in 1964 that after the U-2 was shot down and the pilot moited, uh, he told Soviet Ambassador Dobrin... You have drawn first blood. The president has decided against advice not to respond militarily to that attack. But he should know that if another, you're talking about Dobrin, should know that if another plane was shot at, we would take out all the SAMs and anti-aircraft. And that would almost surely be followed by an invasion. Mm. And they're like, and then they're like, surely with your whole East Coast gone, the United States. <laughs> and they're like, surely with Cuba existing no more <laughs> and Russia. Well, they would have took out the things, though, so it couldn't do nothing to the United States. No, unless they attacked them first. That's true. Let's take a look at drafting response, whatever that means. Missile deflectors, then. We don't even have that now. We do. Trump was just talking about, oh, we need to get something like the Iron Dome. Apparently, we don't have anything like that. We don't have anything like that because we're too big, but um, we definitely have missiles on each coast that shoot down shit. Whether or not how much it can handle, who knows? <clears throat> right. Uh, I don't know what draft in response means, but uh, emissaries sent both by Kennedy and Khrushchev agreed to meet at the Yenching Palace Chinese restaurant in oh. the Cleveland Park neighborhood of Washington, D.C. on Saturday evening, October 27th. Really? Kennedy suggested to, the ta- uh, to take Khrushchev's offer to trade away the missiles. Unknown to most members of the XCOM, but with the support of his brother, the president, Robert Kennedy had been meeting with the Soviet ambassador Dobrynin in uh, Washington to discover whether intentions were genuine. The XCOM was generally against the proposal because it would undermine NATO's authority. Oh, fuck you. Oh, come on, and man. the Turkish government had repeatedly stated it was against any such trade. Fuck you, Turkish right. government. Yeah, we don't care. Where are you? All right. <clears throat> if you plan on taking them out anyway, <clears throat> well, I guess they didn't inform Turkey on this. Apparently not. <laughs> Turkey's like, no, man, we want them. <laughs> As the meeting progressed, a new plan emerged, and Kennedy was slowly persuaded. Mm -hmm. The new plan called for him to ignore the latest message and instead to return to Khrushchev's earlier one. He said, "Mm, I'm not going to go for taking it out of Turkey, but I will go for you removing him from Cuba. (laughs) Right. I I like that one. (laughs) Kennedy was initially hesitant, feeling that Khrushchev would no longer accept the deal because he, he had a new one. Uh, he's like, man, they are, they're feeling good about this one. It is offered. I don't think they can go back to the other one, but, Lulin Lu, Lu, Lu Thompson argued that it was still possible. I like this dude knows. White House Special Counsel and Advisor Ted Sorensen well, and Robert Kennedy left the meeting and returned four or five minutes later. He was a American diplomat. <laughs> cool. So he was a concierge, or he was a counselor. Uh, he was a wise he was man. A key advisor yeah, to he was, Kennedy. He was a wise man. <laughs> Arguably the most influential figure who ever advised U.S. presidents about policy toward the Soviet Union during the Cold War. So this guy was like kind of president in some way of right. some things, just not president. Right. I get it. He's in the president's ear. That's, that could be even worse than being president. You ain't getting, dude. Special. White House Special Counsel and Advisor Ted Sorensen and Robert Kennedy, they left the meeting and returned 45 minutes later with a draft letter to that effect. The president said, uh, I'm going to make some changes. I'll make several changes. 
And then he typed it out and sent it. Well, away. he didn't type it out. <laughs> <laughs> he might have. I doubt it. He said head. After the XCOM meeting, a smaller meeting continued in the Oval Office. A group argued that the letter should be underscored with an oral me- oral message to Dobernin that stated if the missiles were not withdrawn, military action would be used to remove them. Rusk added one provisio that no part of the language of the deal would mention Turkey, but there would be an understanding that the missiles would be removed voluntarily in the immediate aftermath. The president agreed, and the message was sent. Hmm. Ain't that crazy? Hmm. Uh, well, at Russ's, uh, Ruskis' request, Fulman and Scully met again. Scully asked why the two letters from Khrushchev were so different, and Fulman claimed it was because of poor communications. Forget that. It's still happening, huh? Hmm. Wait, still 100 happened. years later. <laughs> Scully replied that the claim was not credible, and he shouted that he thought it was a stinking double cross. Oh, no. He went on to claim that an invasion was only hours away. Fahman stated that a response to the United States message was expected from Khrushchev shortly and urged Galley to tell the, the State Department that no treachery was intended. It's like, dude. It's what the dudes have been saying the whole time, even right. when they lied about having the missiles. Right. Scully said that he did not think anyone would believe him, but he agreed to deliver the message. <laughs> I don't think they're going to believe it, but tell him. <laughs> I'm not freaking tell him, bud. Well, the two then went their separate ways, and Scully immediately typed out a memo for the XCOM. Within the U.S. establishment, it was well understood that ignoring the second offer and returning to the first put Khrushchev in a terrible position. Mm. Military preparations continued, and all active duty Air Force personnel were recalled to their bases for possible action. Oh, shit. They're like, this is the big one, boys. Robert Kennedy later recalled the mood. <laughs> we had not abandoned all hope, but what hope there was now rested with Khrushchev's revi- revi- revising his course within the next few hours. It was a hope, but not an expect- expectation. Mm. Mm. The expectation was military confrontation by Tuesday, which was October 30th, and possibly tomorrow, October 29th. So they're ready to go now. Hmm. 8.05 p.m. Letter drafted earlier in the day was delivered. The message read, as I read you letter, (laughs) (laughs) as I read your letter, the key elements of your proposals, which seem generally acceptable as I understand them, are as follows. One. Why aren't they calling each other? Right. Why the fuck are they sending letters? So stupid. I know. I, I, it's going to get into that, actually. One. You would agree to remove these weapon systems from Cuba under an appropriate United Nations observation and supervision and undertake the suitable safeguards to halt the further introduction of such weapon systems again into Cuba. Two. We, on our part, would agree upon the establishment of adequate arrangements through the United Nations to ensure the carrying out and continuation of these commitments. A, to remove promptly the quarantine measures now in effect. B, to give assurances against the invasion of Cuba. You remove, we don't attack very right. much. The letter was also released directly to the press to ensure it could not be delayed. Damn With the right. letter delivered, a deal was on the table. Mm. As Robert Kennedy noted, there was little expectation it would be accepted. Yeah, I didn't think it would be, right? 9 p.m., the XCOM met again to review the actions for the following day. Plans were drawn up for missile sites as well as other economic targets, notably petroleum storage. Oh, man. Yeah. McNamara stated that they had to have two things ready, a government for Cuba, because we're going to need one. <laughs> right. And secondly, plans for how to respond to the Soviet Union in Europe, because they sure as hell they're going to do something there. You ain't uh, these, uh, this, I don't know. These guys are pushing for shit to happen in Cuba, all these backstage fucking yep. pieces of shit, just so they could take over Cuba. They've been wanting yep. to do that. That's the whole thing. And what made it worse is Russia came over there. And they no, flexed. They had a reason. Well, they flexed too. And Russia actually flexed on the United States. Yeah. But the United States was like, <laughs> wait a minute, guys. We'll, we'll kill everybody. <laughs> right. We don't give a shit. <laughs> we'll kill everybody. We got all of our to, good. To prove our dominance. We got all, we got all of our important people in bunkers, anyways, right. motherfuckers. So. You think we give a shit? <laughs> Mike, son. Sad. Wait. Oh, <laughs> they're going to see it, Lee. <laughs> And Russia's like, well, I don't want to kill all of our people. And they're like, damn, they're going to do it. That's shit. Let's wait another 50 years. <laughs> I don't think these motherfuckers are joking. <laughs> Khrushchev's like, shit. Those, those Boston boys. <laughs> you think they do it? Oh, they'll kill every last one of them. <laughs> they don't give a, <laughs> they don't give a they shit. They don't give a shit. At 12, 12 a.m. Eastern, 27th October, the United States informed its NATO allies that the situation is growing shorter. The United States may find it necessary within a very short time in its interest and that of its fellow nations in the Western Hemisphere to take whatever military action may be necessary. Ooh, they don't like that. 
I don't think NATO cares. Right. They're probably like, yes! <laughs> to add to the consoling, 6 a.m., CIA reported that all missiles in Cuba were ready for action. CIA. <laughs> October 27th. They're there. How do you know? Because we put ready to fire. Right. We pushed the button. <laughs> October 27th, Khrushchev also received a letter from Castro, what is now known as the Armageddon letter, oh. which was dated the day before, oh, no. uh, which was interpreted as urging the use of nuclear force in the event of attack on Cuba. It says, I believe the imperialist aggressiveness is extremely dangerous, and if they actually carry out the brutal act of invading Cuba in violation of international law and morality... That would be the moment to eliminate such danger forever through an act of clear, legitimate defense. However harsh and terrible the solution would be, Castro wrote. Damn, dude. He's like, Daddy, please. Right. <laughs> please, please uh, stop my bolliers. Great. That sucks for Cuba because it's a lose lose situation for them. No matter what happens, they're, fine. they're done. Uh, well, I think it was a lose lose situation for the world. <laughs> right. Right. Wow. Mm. Well, later that very same day, 27th October, what the White House later called Black Saturday, the United States Navy dropped a series of signaling depth charges, which is practice depth charges the size of a hand grenade. So like, how low do we have to drop, and right. what's the right Man, distance? Dude. And they did that on a, su- a Soviet submarine was a B-59 at a blockade line, unaware that it was armed with a <gasps> nuclear tip torpedo with orders that would allow it to be used if the submarine was damaged by depth charges or surface fire. Oh, oh no. Shit. The very thing you're not supposed to do, and they're doing it. <laughs> As the submarine was too deep to monitor any radio traffic, the captain of the B-59, Valentine, Valentin Grigorovich Savitsky, he decided that a war might already have started and wanted to launch a nuclear torpedo. Man, this, this dude is ready. Yeah. The decision to launch these normally only required agreement from the two commanding officers on board, what? the captain and the political officer. Oh. However, the commander of the submarine flotilla, Vasily Arkhipov, was aboard uh, the B-59, and he uh, also had to agree. Oh, shit. Arkhipov objected, and so the nuclear launch was nearly averted. Oh, now. man. Same day, a U-2 spy plane made an accidental, unauthorized 90-minute overflight of the Soviet Union's far eastern coast. Oh, Oh, shit. Soviets responded by scrambling MiG fighters from Wrangell Island. In turn, the Americans launched F-102 fighters armed with nuclear air-to-air missiles over the Barren Sea. Oh, jeez. Damn. They're like, this is just getting too much. We got to do something. Wow. Saturday, 27th October, 1963. After much... 1962, after much deliberation between the United States and the Soviet Union, Kennedy secretly agreed to remove all missiles set in Turkey and possibly southern Italy, the former on the border of the Soviet Union, in exchange for Khrushchev removing all missiles in Cuba. There is some dispute as to whether removing the missiles from Italy was part of the secret agreement. Khrushchev wrote in his memoirs that it was. And when the crisis had ended, McNamara gave the order to dismantle the missiles in both Italy and Turkey. Oh, the Turkey guys pissed. Right. I wonder why they hate us. Now. Right. I, don't, I don't think they like Russia. Right. At this point, Khrushchev knew things the U.S. did not, though. First, that the shooting down of the U-2 by a Soviet missile violated direct orders from Moscow. Oh, really? And Cuban anti-aircraft fire against other reconnaissance U.S. reconnaissance aircraft also violated direct orders from Khrushchev to Castro. No shit. Second, the Soviets already had 162 nuclear warheads on Cuba, too, that the U.S. did not then believe were there. Oh, my. Whoa. Third, the Soviets and... Gee, this guy's had a, a ace in his back pocket. Right. He ain't kidding. Uh, third, the Soviets and Cubans on the island would almost certainly have responded to an invasion by using those nuclear weapons, even though Castro believed that every human in Cuba would likely die as a result. <laughs> <laughs> Khrushchev right. also knew that he may not uh, have considered the fact that he had submarines armed with nuclear weapons that the U.S. Navy may not have known about either. Oh, my. Jeez, dude. Mm. Khrushchev knew he was losing control. How's he losing control? I'd say he's got damn... Well, I got... I don't know. President Kennedy had been told in early 1961 that a nuclear war would likely kill a third of humanity, with most of all of those deaths concentrated in the United States, the USSR, Europe, and China. Well, where's left? India? Khrushchev, right? Khrushchev and Africa. Right, forget about those guys. South America. Oh. <laughs> Khrushchev may well have received similar reports from his military. I hope so. With this background, when Khrushchev heard Kennedy's threats relayed by Robert Kennedy to Soviet Ambassador Dobrin, Dobrinin, he immediately drafted his acceptance of Kennedy's latest terms from his DACA without involving the 
Politburo, as he had previously done, and had them immediately broadcast over Radio Moscow, which he believed the United States would hear. Well, I'm guaranteeing they're hearing it. You kidding. Uh, in that broadcast at 9 a.m. on October 28th, which is still the 27th here. Uh, Khrushchev stated that the Soviet government, in addition to previously issued instructions on the cessation of further work at the building sites for the weapons, has issued a new order on the dismantling of the weapons, which you describe as offensive, and their crating and returning to the Soviet Union. I told him to let him have them. How about that? No, that's a different... <laughs> You're going deeper than that. All right. 10 a.m., October 28th, Kennedy first learned of Khrushchev's solution to the crisis with the U.S. removing the 15 Jupiters in Turkey, and the Soviets would remove the rockets. So who does it first? (laughs) I mean, come on. You both have, like, a group in both places. And and they come down. Now. Now. (laughs) First screw, took it out. All right. And then when the guy leaves, you put the screw back in. (laughs) (laughs) They'll never know. (laughs) Khrushchev had made the offer in public statement for the world to hear. Good for him. Despite almost solid opposition from senior advisors, President Kennedy quickly embraced the Soviet offer. This is a pretty good play of his, Kennedy said, according to a tape recording that he made secretly of the cabinet room meeting. Wow, that's illegal. (laughs) Kennedy had deployed... uh, Kennedy. (laughs) Kennedy. (laughs) Uh, <laughs> they killed Kenny. <laughs> you bastard. You bastard. Kennedy had deployed the Jupiters in March 1962, causing a stream of angry outbursts from Khrushchev. Most people will think this is a rather even trade, and we ought to take advantage of it, Kennedy said. Hmm. Vice President Lyndon Johnson was the first to endorse the missile swap, but others continued to oppose the offer. Finally, Kennedy ended the debate. We can't very well invade Cuba with a, uh, all its toil and blood. Right when we could have gotten them out by making a deal on the same missiles on Turkey. If that's part of the record, then you don't have a very good war. Right. <sighs> Kennedy, imme- Kennedy immediately responded to Khrushchev's letter, issuing a statement calling it an important and constructive contribution to peace. You can I mean, come on. These guys are like right there. We're ready. Ready to talk, boys. Mm. He continued this with a formal letter, he says. He goes, uh, I consider my letter to you of October 27th, and your reply of today has firm undertakings on the part of both our governments, which should be promptly carried out. The U.S. will make a statement in the framework of the Security Council in reference to Cuba as follows. It will declare that the United States of America will respect the inviolability of Cuban borders, its sovereignty, that it will take the pledge not to interfere in internal affairs. You can do what you want, as long as you ain't messing with us, boys. And it will not intrude themselves and not to permit our territory to be used as a bridgehead for the invasion of Cuba. And we'll restrain those who would plan to carry an aggression against Cuba, either from the U.S. territory or from territory of other countries neighboring to Cuba. Mm-hmm. They're like, so we won't. That's a nice little statement. We'll condemn anybody trying to mess with you. And we ain't going to mess with you. Definitely not going to do it on from our soil. Right. Uh, Kennedy's plan statement would also contain suggestions that he received from his survivor, uh, advisor, Schlesinger Jr., in a memorandum for the president describing the post-mortem on Cuba. October 28th, Kennedy participated in telephone conversations with Eisenhower and fellow former U.S. President Harry Truman. Truman's like, uh, I know a little something about dropping bombs, buddy. Right. In these calls, Kennedy revealed that he thought the crisis would result in the two superpowers being toe-to-toe mm. in Berlin by the end of the following month and expressed concern that the Soviet setback in Cuba would make things tougher there. Yeah, I think... I'm sure. He also informed his predecessors that he had rejected the public Soviet offer to withdraw from Cuba in exchange for the withdrawal of U.S. What? Why are you lying now? (laughs) Right. Wow. The United States continued to blockade. In the following days, aerial reconnaissance, reconnaissance, (laughs) aerial reconnaissance proved that the Soviets were making progress and removing other missile systems. Perfect. 42 missiles and their support equipment were loaded onto eight Soviet ships. 2nd of November, 1962. President Kennedy addressed the U.S. via radio and television broadcasts regarding the dismantlement process of the Soviet R-12 missile bases located in the Caribbean region. The ships left Cuba on the 5th and to the 9th of November. The United States made a final visual check as each of the ships passed the blockade line. Further diplomatic efforts were required to remove the Soviet IL-28 bombers, and they were loaded on three Soviet ships on the 5th and 6th of December. Concurrent with the Soviet commitment on the IL-28, the United States announced that the end of the blockade from 6.45 p.m. on November 20th, 1962. Damn, dude. Almost a year Man. before uh, Kennedy gets moited. 
Right. Uh, at that time, when the Kennedy administration thought that the Cuban Missile Crisis was resolved, nuclear tactical rockets stayed in Cuba since they were not a part of the Kennedy Khrushchev understandings, oh. and the Americans did not even know about them. Oh, shit. Like all Americans, even Kennedy? Wow. Well, the Soviets changed their minds, fearing possible future Cuban militant steps, and on November 22nd, 1962, Deputy Premier of the Soviet Union, Anastas Mykoen, told Castro that the rockets with the nuclear warheads were being removed as well. They said, we're taking all our shit back. Uh, he's like, yeah. Because uh, now I'm sure they don't even trust Castro. Oh, no. This, this not. dude's going to fuck up everything. Right, definitely not. Mm. I guarantee you he gave him the cold shoulder the whole time. Any Russian people. <laughs> Mm. Peasants. Little peasants. This is my land. The Cuban Missile Crisis was solved in part by a secret agreement by JFK and Nikita Khrushchev. Yes. The Kennedy Khrushchev Pact was known only by nine U.S. officials at the time of its creation. Damn, so he even lied to his former uh, president boys. Right. Wow. And it was the first time officially acknowledged at a conference in Moscow in January 1989. Damn. By Soviet Ambassador Dobrynin and Kennedy speechwriter Theodore Sorensen. In his negotiations with Soviet Ambassador Anatoly Dobrynin, Robert Kennedy informally proposed that the Jupiter missiles in Turkey would be removed within a short time after this crisis was over. They're like, you just got to remove all that shit first because we were already here first. Right. So you get all that shit out of there and then... Think about it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you a 20-year we'll, year, twenty we'll, year time frame on... To, we'll, we'll see. Get, we'll give you a 100-year time frame on how we'll get this stuff out. <laughs> right. uh, under an operation code named Operation Pot Pie. Ooh, marching Pot Pie. Because it's in Turkey. What? Because it's in Turkey. What is? The missiles. Okay. Turkey Popeye. Damn it. <laughs> Under an operation code named Operation Popeye, the removal of the Jupiters <laughs> from Italy and Turkey began on April 1st and was completed by April 24th, no 1963. Look at these guys. The initial plans were to recycle the missiles for use in other programs, use in other countries. <laughs> right. But NASA and the U.S. Air Force were not interested in retaining the missile hardware. Nah, they're like, we don't okay. care. Missile bodies were destroyed on site. Warheads, guidance packages, and launching equipment worth $14 million were returned to the United States. The dismantling operations were named Pot Pie 1 for Italy and Pot Pie 2 for Turkey by the United States Air Force. Okay, fantastic. Cool. Right. The practical, the, <clears throat> the practical effect of Kennedy and Khrushchev's pact was that the United States would remove their rockets from Italy and Turkey, and that the Soviets had no intention of resorting to nuclear war if they were outgunned by the U.S. But like, hey, man, if we ever do fight, just leave those nukes alone. Just let us take you out with their little M16s. Because the withdrawal of Jupiter missiles from NATO bases in Italy and Turkey was not made public at the time, Khrushchev appeared to have lost the conflict and became weakened. Oh, dude. Uh, the perception was that Kennedy had won the contest between the superpowers and that Khrushchev had been humiliated. Both Kennedy and Khrushchev took every step to avoid full conflict, despite pressures from the respective governments. Yeah, both, both people around them were like, you got to do it. You look right. like a bitch. Right. Khrushchev had power for another two years. As a direct result to the crisis, the United States and the Soviet Union set up a direct line of communication. Now, Damn right. They need it. This hotline between the Soviet <laughs> Union and the United States was a way for the president and premier to have negotiations should a crisis like this ever happen again. Uh, there's no Don't reason know why they didn't in right. the first place. There's no reason why the president of the United States can't sit down in the Oval Office and call any leader in the world. Yeah. No reason. The situation was tense between these guys. I don't care if it's tense or not. You still got his number. Now there's a, a dedicated phone line that right. just to the Russia. Right. It's still in place. It needs to be. There's no reason why you just can't be like, if Biden was at like two in the morning. Just imagine like, like, I want to talk to Putin. And nowadays, <laughs> they're just like texting each other. Right. <laughs> hey, buddy, you're going to come down hey, and uh, hey, come down to Ukraine? Putin's like, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> no, not today. <laughs> You guys, you guys just need to stick your nose out of it, man. That's not even cool. And then Why are you like, leaving me on read? <laughs> on read. <laughs> and Biden's like, true to national depression. I don't even know how he spells it. <laughs> it's just, just a bunch of letters. Right. And Putin's like, yeah, go to bed. <laughs> Jeez. By the time the crisis in October 1962, total number of nuclear weapons and stockpiles of each country numbered approximately 26,400 for the United States, 3,300 for the Soviet Union. For the United States, around 3,500 with combined yield approximately 6,300 megatons would have been used in attacking the Soviet Union. Mm. Soviets had consider considerably less strategic firepower at their disposal. Some 300 to 320 bombs and warheads without submarine-based weapons in a position to threaten the U.S. mainland 
and most of their intercontinental delivery systems based on bombers that would have difficulty penetrating North American air defense systems. Right, you can't just... That's the only way they have to deliver right. them as planes. That's why they love Cuba, because they can get there. Right. However, they had already moved 158 warheads to Cuba. Between 95 and 100 would have been ready for use if the United States invaded Cuba. Most of which were short range, which yeah, gets bye bye Florida and right. uh, the coast right there. Right. Carolina. Lu- Louisiana. Georgia. Maybe bottom of Texas. Right. They don't want to get too close to Mexico. <laughs> the United States approximately 4,375 nuclear weapons deployed in Europe, most of which were tactical weapons such as nuclear artillery, with around 450 of them for ballistic missiles. Missiles. <laughs> with around 450 of them for ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and aircraft. The Soviets had more than 550 similar weapons in Europe as well. Let's take a look at the Cuban leadership throughout this. Huh? Okay. Focused uh, mainly on the other two, but obviously All right. uh, a little more was going on. Cuba perceived the outcome as a betrayal by the Soviets, as decisions on right. how to resolve the crisis had been made exclusively by Kennedy and Khrushchev. Like, Castro's right. like, hey, man, you're in my country. <laughs> right. Castro was especially upset that certain issues of interest to Cuba, such as the status of the right. naval base in Guantanamo Bay, were not addressed. That caused Cuban-Soviet relations to deteriorate for years to come. Oh, that's not what they wanted. No. Mm. Historian Arthur Schlesinger believed that when the missiles were withdrawn, Castro was more angry with Khrushchev than with Kennedy because Khrushchev had not consulted Castro before deciding that. Right. Although Castro was infuriated by him, he planned on striking the U.S. with the remaining missiles if an invasion of the island recurred. He said, I'm t- that's why they removed the other what? ones. They weren't stupid. They're like, Castro's going to use these damn right. things, and we don't know if the USA is going right, to not invade us. or not anyway. And not blame us either. Right. A mm. few weeks after the crisis, during an interview with the British Communist, uh, damn, with the British Communist newspaper, the Daily what? Worker, Guevara. having a communist newspaper today. Well, I right, guess you do. Right. Guevara was still fuming over the perceived Soviet betrayal and told Was Cor- Guevara and Castro friends? I think kind of, yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, I think they're like not friends, but. I think. Didn't he? He didn't like the Russians. Oh, man. Uh, Guevara going to take apart the rebel army and convince Castro with competence. Yep. Yeah, okay. Buddies. Oh, he's a revolution leader, right? Mm-hmm. And Castro was like the leader leader, but mm-hmm. it could. Che right. was like the military, military guy. guy. Right, yeah. I get it. But he was Argentin- Argentinian anyways. That's fine. A few weeks after the crisis during an interview with the British Communist newspaper of the Daily Worker, Guevara was still fuming over the perceived Soviet betrayal. And told, Poor guy. Right, and told correspondent Sam Russell that if the missiles had been under Cuban control, they would have fired them off. Yeah, because you guys are idiots. Dumb. Well, expounding on the incident later, Guevara reiterated that the cause of socialist liberation against global imperialist aggression would ultimately have been worth the possibility of millions of atomic war victims. That's how stupid. And all right. these little fucking uh, little lefties and people, or right. Che Guevara was great. That's, right. This is the people you're dealing with. He's Even like, Castro, oh, I don't care if we kill everybody. Right. He's like, if it means that we can uh, advance our ideology and it takes out Millions of people, so be it, it. But it extincts our ideology at the same time. Right. Because that's how stupid these fucking people right. are. And so so be it. We'll we'll freaking go back to the Aztec days of age, right? Where you couldn't even walk into somebody's uh, territory without getting murdered. Well, not only that, go back to Aztec ways of living. Right. Because once you uh, start unleashing nukes, it's over with. you're uh, back to... Yeah, fucking BC times, right. pretty much. But you just have the shit that used to work around that the Mayans Maybe, and Aztecs right. didn't have. Maybe. What 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 electrical infrastructure would you have at that point? Right. And the missile crisis further convinced Guevara that the world's two superpowers, the United States and Soviet Union, use Cuba as a pawn in their own global strategies. How about you? Soviet Union definitely did. Right. Definitely. And the United States and was bullying Cuba. Cash was an <laughs> idiot. <laughs> bullying. <laughs> They're bullying Cuba. Yeah. <laughs> Fidel was a moron. Right. Afterward, he denounced the Soviets almost a as frequently as he denounced Americans. Said, Good for him. Forget those whiteies. Awesome. <laughs> what about Romanian leadership? Where's uh, Romania well, coming well, to this? Well, <laughs> uh, like, hey guys, and we're here. You remember <laughs> Romania? <laughs> <laughs> During the crisis, and gladiators and stuff. You know. That's Roman. Yes. Rome's in Italy. Oh, Romanian. <laughs> Romanian. Yeah, totally forgot. <laughs> <laughs> right, you even forgot about him. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, right. Yeah, the Romanian. The Romanian. still alive? Of course they are. They're still around? Romania. Hmm. Right? I guess. Is Romania still there? I don't know. They might have changed into something. Transylvania? Romania. Yeah, still a country. 
Oh, yeah, it's a beautiful country. I'm sure it is. <laughs> During the crisis, George spelled with a lot of uh, unnecessary H's. <laughs> George, uh, George, 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 General Secretary of Romania's Communist Party sent a letter to the President Kennedy disassociating Romania from Soviet actions. He said, I don't want no part of this. And it wasn't us, guys. And this uh, convinced the American administration of Bucharest, Bucharest's intentions of detaching itself from Moscow. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Good for you guys. Right. Right. And then they called the, the Soviet and were like, hey, man, man we don't want we nothing, don't to, do nothing to do with America, man. <laughs> or Europe. <laughs> right. Just you guys. <laughs> we're good, man. We don't even like Castro either. <laughs> Wow. Let's take a look at Soviet leadership after this. Significance of how close the world came to thermonuclear war impelled Khrushchev to propose a far reaching easing of tensions with the U.S. And they scared a little, uh, right. a little shit in both of these guys' diapers. Huh? Right. They're like, oh, uh. In a letter President Kennedy dated on uh, October 30th, 1962, Khrushchev outlined a range of bold initiatives to forestall, to forestall the possibility of a further nuclear crisis including proposing a non-aggression treaty between the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is NATO, and the Warsaw Pact, or even disbanding these military blocs. A treaty to cease all nuclear weapons testing and even the elimination of all nu- nuclear weapons altogether. Not going to happen. Right. China's like, no. <laughs> I don't even think they're building yet. Right. Resolute. They probably already had them. Maybe. Resolution of the... China wasn't shit at this yeah, point. Yeah, true. Dude. China blew up in like 20 years, dude. Yeah. Resolution of hot button issue of Germany by both East and West formally accepting the existence of West Germany and East Germany. And the United States recognition of the government of the mainland China. Like you just gotta let these people do what they're doing. I guess, but clearly none of that's gonna happen. No. Uh, letter invited counter proposals and further explorations of these and other issues through peaceful negotiations. Khrushchev, that's why he had to go. Like Russia's like Fuck these letters though. Get on the phone and talk to the sons of bitches. How about meat? Right. Son of a bitch. Go to uh, Switzerland or something. All right. <laughs> Sweet Switzerland, yeah. yeah Switzerland. Khrushchev invited Norman Cousins, the editor of a major U.S. periodical and an anti-nuclear weapons activist, to serve as a liaison between uh, President Kennedy and him. And Cousins met with Khrushchev for four hours in December of 1962. Kennedy's response to Khrushchev's proposals was lukewarm. But Kennedy expressed to Cousins that he felt constrained in exploring these issues due to pressure from hardliners and the United States national security apparatus. <sighs> the United States and the Soviet Union did shortly thereafter agree on a treaty ban in atmospheric testing oh. of nuclear weapons okay. known as the Partial Nuclear Test right. Ban Treaty. Right. You can't you can't test in the air, but you can damn well blow up in the ocean and in uh, well, secluded parts the, of your country. The only reason why I did that, because all that shit that was going on in Nevada and all that, and you got, the United States was like, man, we're messing up our own shit. We're getting some hillbilly three-eyed motherfuckers running around. What the hell's going on? That wasn't in air shit, was it? I mean, the cloud was there. I'm sure, it went somewhere. I had to have, right? Well, I mean, there's a big old thing how uh, all that nuclear testing caused a bunch of storms. Because if you look at right uh, tornado outbreaks and shit around the time that they were testing, right. there was a shit done. Right. The night, the Beecher tornado is because that storm started way down by uh, in the middle of the country and then strengthened when it came here. It's true. And they're like. There's one of the theories that that was kicked off by a nuclear test that was like a week before then or something. It had to have been, dude, because that was a big old effort fiver up in Michigan. There's no way. Middle of Michigan. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, there's all sorts of things. I'm sure it fucked up a lot of shit. Mm. That movie, The Hills Have Eyes, is not far, far off from the... Well, obviously. Just, I mean, it's got the same stuff down in the old Ozarks. The Mountain Boys. That's for a different reason. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same effect. Right. Further, after the crisis, the United States and the USSR created the Moscow-Washington Hotline, a direct communication link between Moscow and Washington. We do know this, yes. The purpose of this is to have the leaders of the cold, two Cold War countries they can communicate directly and solve such a crisis if it ever happened again. Mm. Compromise, embarrassed, they should be next, the phone should be next to each other's beds. Or, or wherever they're at, there should be a, a phone. This is before cell phones. Right, so. clearly. The compromise. Well, maybe, we don't know. Right. Don't, right. <laughs> compromise embarrassed Khrushchev and the Soviet Union because the withdrawal of the United States missiles from Italy and Turkey was a secret deal between Kennedy and Khrushchev. So it wasn't made public, no one knew about it. That's crazy. Why would Khrushchev, I get whatever. They didn't publicly admit it. We 
Right. They said until 1989. Right. Khrushchev went to Kennedy as he thought that the crisis was getting out of hand, but the Soviets were seen as retreating from circumstances that they had started. Yeah, Khrushchev's fall from power two years later was in part because of the Soviet politi- pol- Politburo's oh, embarrassment at both Khrushchev's eventual concessions to the United States and this ineptitude in precipitating the crisis in the first place. Dude, I bet he got his ass handed to him for these two years, just blasted by everybody. Man, I'm surprised he lasted two years. Right. According to Brennan, the top Soviet leadership took the Cuban outcome as a blow to its prestige bordering on humiliation. Oh, wow. Wow, they're like, it's going to take us years to recover from this. Right. Let's take a look at the old U.S. leadership. Worldwide, United States Forces DEFCON 3 status was returned to DEFCON 4, 20th of November, 1962. General Curtis Lee May told the president that the resolution of the crisis was the greatest defeat in our history. Oh, what? You guys are a bunch of bullshit. We couldn't blow each other up yeah. and kill a fucking third of the world, oh, so you, you we're, we're, we both look like pussies. Right. Don't Idiots. Worry. Don't worry. You guys can uh, try to flex your muscles in a few years and get your asses kicked because of this cool. thinking in the United States. Vietnam. Well, it's, Vietnam's already going on, isn't it? Right. But they don't get into 67. Right. Uh, yeah. That's why. And then they start, they're so pissed off at the, that's why I messed up there. These military guys are so pissed that they couldn't kill people in Cuba or the world. <laughs> so, right. So they're like, let's, let's so, try our hand at Vietnam. They're like, who's fighting right now? Vietnam? We can do that. Right. I'm like, dude, we've never been in a jungle in our lives. <laughs> let's just walk around Georgia for a while. It's not the same. What is Cambodia? Cambodia? That should be easy. Right. What is Cambodia? Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Right. Uh, Bosnia? Um, let's fire everybody on this staff. Yeah, the stupidity. Jeez. Um, Curtis LeMay had pressed for an immediate invasion of Cuba. It also soon. says that LeMay's uh, stance was, was a, a minority. minority position, right? Mm, but that minority is very big guys, though. Well, minor, the, what do they call it? What do they say nowadays? The minority is the loudest yeah. nowadays? So. Well, uh, LeMay had pressed for an immediate invasion of Cuba as soon as the crisis began and still favored invading Cuba, even after the Soviets had withdrawn <laughs> the missiles. 25 years later, LeMay still believed... We could have gotten not only the missiles out of Cuba, we could have gotten the communists out of Cuba at that time. Shut up. Idiots. By 1962, President Kennedy faced four crisis situations. Failure of the Bay of Pigs, yeah, idiots. Settlement negotiations between the pro-Western government of Laos and the Pathet Lao communist movement. Mm. Kennedy sidestepped Laos, whose rugged terrain was no battleground for Americans. They even knew now. Right. Laos is the same thing. There's no way. As Vietnam and all that, that rugged terrain, they were not... Like, the only way to defeat these guys is to be inhumane and just blow them up with missiles. Like, for, like, Afghanistan and stuff, you could you could set up right mock, like, battlefields and shit in the right. desert. Right. You're not setting up a mock fucking jungle anywhere in uh, America to train soldiers. Not at all. You can try to go. We could go there now and probably still get fucked up. Dude, We'd probably right. win now because, obviously, the intelligence and fucking technology and shit oh, is we'll still better. Get messed but, up. Right. Well, still ground forces up. for sure would get ground forces up. all day but like i said you don't even know there's a whole town under tree canopies right and you blow up a whole damn town it's ridiculous um he also had the construction of the berlin wall that was a major thing and the cuban missile crisis was his four uh his four crisis situations in his three years as president wow well, Kennedy believed that yet another failure to gain control and stop communist expansion would irreparably damage U.S. credibility. What's, uh, I still don't get behind the whole thing of these big countries trying to stop these communists. Other, well, Why? Guys, here's to our point. He was now determined to draw a line in the sand and prevent a communist victory in Vietnam. Good luck. Mm. One of the worst war movies to watch is the Vietnam movies. I could watch World War II... Well, World just one. right there, exactly why we got into Vietnam. They're just the hardest to watch, dude. We look like idiots. Idiots. Against communism in Russia and uh, uh, Cuba. So we're like, we'll go into Vietnam and at least, at least make it known to the world that we still fight against communism. We can defeat it. I don't think there was one Vietnam movie that I watched where the end of the movie where we kicked ass. There's usually there's the last of the uh, platoon or whatever is getting, you know, carried, carried out of there by helicopters. We were soldiers. Um, platoon. <laughs> we were soldiers. No, I'm uh, saying we were soldiers was. Uh, uh, I don't know if that was Vietnam. I think that was World War II, wasn't no, it? No, we were soldiers. Uh, prisoners of war, casualties of war. 
Was that Vietnam? I think it was World War II. Yeah, it's the first oh, American Vietnam. phase of the war. Uh, they got surrounded fucking in the yeah big area clearing, and they were getting like picked off. And mm-hmm. I mean, that was kind of like a All redemption that. story because we eventually got those guys out around us, but they fucked right. us up at the beginning. Oh, dude, yeah. Uh, Kennedy told James Rustin of the New York Times immediately after his Vienna summit meeting with Khrushchev. Now we have a problem making our power credible. And Vietnam looks like the place. <laughs> wow. Mm. At, least four, at least four contingency strikes were armed and launched from Florida against Cuban airfields and suspected missile sites in 1963 and 1964. Although all were diverted to the Pine Castle Grange complex after the planes past Andros Island. The critics, including Seymour Melman and Seymour Hirsch. Oh, they, damn, a couple Seymours. <laughs> right. They suggested that Cuban Missile Crisis encouraged the United States' use of military means, such as the case in later Vietnam. Yeah, exactly. I totally believe that. Uh, similarly, Lorraine Bayard DeValo has suggested that the masculine brinksmanship of the Cuban Missile Crisis had become a touchstone of toughness by which presidents are measured. I don't think so. Right. Actions in 1962 would go on to have a significant influence on the future policy decisions of those who occupied the White House, leading to foreign policy decisions such as Lyndon B. Johnson's escalation of war in the Vietnam three years. Because he's like, that's what I'm saying. When they got to Vietnam, they're like, we can't look like pussies here like right. we just did in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah, they're dumb. Sad. And they did, too. Man, right? Sad. Take a look at human casualties. U-2 pilot Anderson's body is returned to the United States. It's buried with full military honors South Carolina. He was the first recipient of the new created Air Force Cross. Although Anderson was the only combatant fatality during the crisis, 11 crew members of three reconnaissance Boeing RB-47 Stratojets of the 55th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing were also murdered in crashes during the period between 27th of September and 11th of November. Yeah, I'm just scratching, huh? Right. Jeez. Seven crew, seven crew members died when a military air transport service Boeing C-135B straddle lifter delivering ammo to Guantanamo Bay Naval Base stalled and then crashed on approach on the 23rd of October. That's, That's a lot sucks. of plane crashes in a relatively short period. Now. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at some later revelations before we wrap this up. We have a submarine coast call. Arguably, the most dangerous moment in the crisis was not recognized until the Cuban Missile Crisis Havana Conference in October of 20. Two or right. 20, 2002. They all started talking about it and they're like, dude, do you guys you know you how guys, close we were? <laughs> right. like, Which was shit. attended by many of the veterans of the crisis. They all learned that on October 27, 1962, the USS Beale had tracked and dropped signaling depth charges, which were the size of hand grenades on B 59, a Soviet Project 641 submarine. Known to the U.S., it was armed with a 15 kiloton. Un- unknown to the U.S., it was armed with a 15 oh, kiloton nuclear torpedo. Dude. Running out of air, the Soviet submarine was surrounded by American warships and yeah. desperately needed to surface. An argument broke out among three officers aboard B-59, including the submarine captain, Valentin Savinsky. Political officer Ivan Shemanovanovich, Maslavanovich, and Deputy Brigade Commander, Captain Second Rank, U.S. Navy Commander Rank Equivalent, okay, uh, Vasily Arkhipov, and exhausts Savinsky became furious in order that the nuclear torpedo on board he made combat ready. Accounts differ about whether Arkhipov convinced Savitsky not to uh, make the attack or whether Savitsky himself finally concluded that the only reasonable choice left him uh, left open to him was to come to the surface. All right. During the conference, McNamara stated that nuclear war had come much closer than people had thought. Thomas Blanton, director of the National Security, Security Archive, said a guy called Vasily Arkhipov saved the world. Ooh. Later the movie. Later the movie. Well, it could be. What is uh, it? Uh, Red right October? October 1992. Was confo- yeah, I think it was. Right. right. October 1992. It was confirmed that the Soviet forces in Cuba had already received tactical nuclear warheads for their artillery rockets and IL-28 bombers when the crisis broke. O. Fidel Castro stated that he would have recommended their use if the United States invaded despite Cuba being destroyed. He didn't care. He would have died, too. Idiot. What do you have? 50 years after the crisis, Graham Allison, he wrote this. 50 years ago, the Cuban Missile Crisis brought the world to the brink of nuclear disaster. During the standoff, United States President John F. Kennedy thought the chance of escalation to war was between one and three and even. All right. (laughs) And what if we have learned... One and three means one and three chance we go, or Mm -hmm. even a 50-50. Right. And what we have learned in later decades has nothing to do... To lengthen those odds. 
Ah, we know now, well, this is what he says again, I guess. We know now, for example, that in addition to nuclear-armed ballistic missiles, the Soviet Union had deployed 100 tactical nuclear weapons to Cuba, and the local Soviet commander there could have launched these weapons without additional codes or commands from Moscow. That's just a stupid, shitty situation. Right. U.S. airstrike and invasion that were scheduled for the third week of the confrontation would likely have triggered a nuclear response against American ships and troops, nice. and perhaps even Miami. Oh, shit. The result of war might have led to the deaths of over 100 million Americans and over 100 million Russians. Damn right. It's crazy, dude. Wow. BBC journalist Joe Matthews, he published a story on October 13, 2012, behind the 100 tactical nuclear warheads mentioned by Grayson Allen, Graham Allen. Grayson Allen? Is that a basketball player? <laughs> Graham Allison in an excerpt above. Khrushchev feared that Castro's hurt pride and widespread Cuban indignation over the concessions he made to content. Khrushchev feared that... Castro's hurt pride and the widespread Cuban indignation over the concessions he had made to Kennedy might lead to a breakdown of the agreement between the Soviets and the United States. To prevent, to prevent that, Khrushchev decided to offer uh, to give Cuba 100 tactical nuclear weapons that had been shipped to Cuba along with long-range missiles, but crucially had escaped the notice of the United States intelligence. He's like, they don't know about these, right. so we'll give you this. You just calm your fucking ass down, right. Fidel. Don't use them. <laughs> right, not yet. <laughs> Khrushchev determined that because the Americans had not listed the missiles on their list of demands, keeping them in Cuba would be in the Soviet Union's interest. I'm I mean, sure he did. Why not, right? Uh, Anastas Mikoyan was tasked with the negotiations with Castro over the missile transfer deal that was designed to prevent a breakdown in the relations between Cuba and the Soviet Union. While in Havana, McCohen witnessed the mood swings and paranoia of Castro, who was convinced that Moscow had made the agreement with the U.S. at the expense of Cuba's defense. McCohen, on his own initiative, decided that Castro and his military should not be given control of weapons with an explosive force equal to 100 Hiroshima-sized bombs under any circumstances. He's like, this dude is he's a fucking uh, paranoid son of a bitch. Right. We don't give people like that <laughs> control. Mm. Wow. Wow. He diffused a seemingly intractable situation, which risked re-escalating the crisis on November 22nd, 1962. During a tense four-hour meeting, McCohen convinced Castro that despite Moscow's desire to help, it would be in breach of an unpublished Soviet law, which did not actually exist, to transfer the missiles permanently into Cuban hands and provide them with an independent nuclear deterrent. You no, know, you ain't going to be independent. He's like, well, Soviet law says we you can't, do, can't it. do it. Sorry, buddy. Sorry, buddy. Well, Castro was forced to give way, and much to the relief of Khrushchev and the rest of the Soviet government, the tactical nuclear weapons were created, were created and returned uh, by sea to the Soviets during December 1962. I mean, what was Castro really going to do? Right. No. Stand in front of him while they're trying to take no. it. <laughs> Let's take a look at popular culture. The American popular media, especially television, made frequent use of the events of the missile crisis oh, in both sure. fictional and documentary forms. Jim Willis includes the crisis as one of the hundred media moments that changed America. Sheldon Stern finds that a half century later, there are still many misconceptions Half through half truths and outright lies that have hmm. shaped the media versions of what happened in the White House during those harrowing two weeks. Wow. Historian William Cohn argued nineteen seventy six article that television programs are typically the main source used by the American public to know about and inter interpret the past. According to the Cold War historian Andre Kozove, Soviet media proved somewhat disorganized as it was unable to generate a coherent popular history. <laughs> Khrushchev lost power and was airbrushed out of the story. Cuba was no longer betrayed as heroic David against an American Goliath. <laughs> One contradiction that pervaded the Soviet media campaign was between the pacifistic rhetoric of the peace movement that emphasizes the horrors of nuclear war and the militancy, militancy of need to prepare Soviets for war against American aggression. Cool. Uh, <laughs> you guys got it. There's the... Uh, Get it got good? You guys understand all that? <laughs> <laughs> the Cuban Missile Crisis in a two-hour nutshell. <laughs> oh, man. Right. It took a lot longer than I thought it was. Of course time. it was. Uh, it? Oh. I had other... That was the stupidest thing I've ever... It was just dumb. It was just people flexing their freaking muscles. That's all it was. Well, the thing is, the two leaders of the actual countries weren't even the ones that wanted to do it. Right. And it was all the fucking idiots around them. Idiots. That's why stupid politicians so, and the, governments are all fucking dumb, stupid. Dude. And all that led to both countries feeling weak. In the perception of... Right. The public eye 
Oh, America's not this great superpower. Look at they, Russia. They back down from Russia. Look now, at Russia. On the they other are, side, are. Russia's not so great. They back down from America. And then America's like, let's go into the jungle and fight people. <laughs> <laughs> we got to prove our prowess against communists. Wait, should we Should we like look up? And, no, we got to hit on it. It's just trees. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> what possibly can happen? All right. Oh, jeez. Man, idiots. <laughs> and they were there for like five years, they weren't were they? They were there until 70, 75, 76. Oh, they were there like eight yeah. years. Yeah, it was a while. Pitity. Dumbest shit ever seen. The 60s and 70s were the worst part in American history. Yeah. Well, dumb. I had a whole. Timeline. 50s were fantastic. Yeah, it wasn't the because there was a Korea War. Korea, as well. Yeah, but Korean right. War. A lot of people died. They <laughs> <I> did. <laughs> um, yeah, that right. was basically the same, too, because you've seen Korea, Korea's. Uh, and we wanted Geography. South Korea to win there as well. <sighs> Clearly, uh, didn't work out because they're still in North and South Korea. <laughs> right. We'll be back next week for more, according to Wikipedia, where the mother is going to be. Bing, bing.